and good morning. Some of you are probably really familiar with what's going to be discussed today. And perhaps some of you really are here because, hey, I really need to get a good baseline understanding for what, you know, what this rulemaking team accomplished. And, uh, and if that's the case, I'm, I'm glad. Uh, this is going to be a really good learning opportunity for you. <clears throat> and what this Part 23, uh, what it represents and what I believe it can accomplish moving, moving forward. But before we uh, get into those discussions, I, I thought it would be neat to kind of talk a little bit about the history. Um, because we didn't just get to this point overnight. There was a lot of strategic thinking that had to take place. Uh, there was a lot of really hard conversations, a lot of bringing people along with us, um, and a lot of commitment uh, from some, many of you in this room uh, as part of the Aviation Rulemaking Committee. So let me, let's talk a few, for a few minutes, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about that history. So if we go back to about 2006 or so, do you guys remember um, that those dog fighting airplanes where you could rent to get into a T-30, I think it's a T-34, one of the old military trainers, and you could do combat air, air maneuvering, right, and, and simulated dog fights. And what was happening was there was, we, there was a very sharp spike in wing separations on those airplanes and a lot of fatal accidents. So my boss at the time, John Colomy, who some of you in this room know, uh, he met with representatives from that industry and started asking questions. And one of the pilots, you know, one of the pilots just said, look, I don't understand this. The airplane was designed for 6Gs, so I should be able to go and fly 6Gs all day, every day. And that's when we realized, okay, there's a disconnect here. There's a disconnect in the way the airplane was designed and the way the airplane's being operated and perhaps even the way it's being maintained. So per John, we formed, and I may, Greg was a part of it, maybe some of you in this room were part of this as well. We formed a Part 23 certification process study, the CPS, which was really, it was industry and the agency coming together to say, it's time that we get smarter on GA. And we just simply want recommendations on making airplanes safer, making pilots safer, and making maintenance better. And we received, that was about a two-year study, 56 recommendations. But two of those recommendations, two of those is why we're here today. And fun fact, those two recommendations were directly from Greg. So when we talk about whose idea was this, it was Greg's. It really was. It was Greg that introduced this concept during one of the meetings of the CPS. And he said, you know, your Part 23 is really prescriptive and it really dictates design. So it would be really nice if you could think more along performance-based measures, make it a more performance-based or outcome-based set of regulations. Oh, and by the way, you guys struggle keeping up with technology and writing policy and guidance to address that new technology you might want to interact with some consensus body, some industry standards, so they can help you write methods of compliance. And that, so those two recommendations are in the certification process study report. After that, we, we hit the road. Lowell, Lowell oversaw several public meetings where we grew that idea. We grew those two recommendations, got additional input both from industry and the public, and then in 2011, we launched the uh, Part 23 Aviation Rulemaking, uh, what was, it was, the, uh, it was Part 23 Reorganization Aviation Rulemaking Committee, ARC. Some of you were a part of that. And at, one of the things, one of the goals from that ARC with the recommendations from industry, and then later as those recommendations moved over to the agency and we, we actually conducted rulemaking, our goal was always, let's, <coughs> Writing a rule is, is not a lot of fun. It's actually a very difficult process. And it should be because you're potentially put, placing a burden on the public. So there should be a rather uh, rigid process to, to, to get from point A to point B. So we said, well, we don't want to do this every day. So let's make sure we try to capture whatever technologies we see between now and the next 25 years. Now, so several weeks ago, did anyone get an opportunity to go to the Uber Elevate 
uh, uh, sessions. I know, Greg, you were there. So Uber, um, for two days, discussed their model for urban air transportation. I was talking to Carrie this morning about this, where what their vision is is a, just a collection of, uh, of either electric or hybrid electric vehicles, two to four passengers, um, that you summon them on your cell phone, they show up to a, a, a designated location, they, you hop in, you tell it where you're going, and it takes you to that, to that location, and then it charges itself for about five minutes, and then it's ready for the next uh, set of passengers. Um, obviously, we're not there as an agency. We're not there yet. But it's fun to note that I formed a team already within my, my office, and Lowell's one of the members of this team, where we're working, the, we're trying to figure out what do we need to do to get from you know, our current state with, we use pilots and we use pilots that talk to air traffic control and we're very, you know, just very traditional in the way we operate airplanes. And what do we have to do to get from that point to this new point of autonomous operations and this idea where you as an untrained pilot might be placed in charge of the airplane. Perhaps you might be asked to watch a short video and then learn how to program your destination. So we're trying to figure out what do we need to do to get from point A to point B? Always start with the end in mind, right? So we're, the first step is let's take a look at let's take a look at the regulatory requirements and identify any regulatory gaps. And what uh, what we're really excited about is this new Part 23. It's about the 90% solution, and that's pretty good. Um, there's and that's important because that limits the number of special conditions or other requirements that we have to issue to address things like vertical flight. So we did a pretty good job, didn't get it perfect, but we're pretty excited for what we did accomplish. So, so hopefully today is gonna to be really educational for you. I hope you get a lot out of it. I encourage you to ask questions. Yeah, we've got Lowell Foster and Steve Thompson here, and they're both the most knowledgeable folks in my office on this rulemaking. So this, if you have questions, today's the day to, to ask those. First, just to frame things out, I wanted to um, make sure everyone understands the world of aviation right now. So this is the slide I often show folks and we used back in the original days of the rulemaking committee. Um, if you were to look, what's in the sky? This is what's in the sky today. So about uh, 265,000 piston airplanes, um, 20,000 rotorcraft, 12,500 turboprops, business jets, a good chunk of business jets, and then 19,000 airliners. Those 19,000 airliners, that's what the public knows, right? That is what everybody thinks of when they think of aviation and that is where the FAA is required to spend most of its time so it's the highest level of care it's what um, people are paying revenue for and it is where all the effort and time and rulemaking and people spend their their days at the FAA um, we are lucky enough to have guys in the small aircraft directorate who are dedicated to our world who love this stuff who fly who engage in it but they get very little rulemaking priority so when they want to make a change it's very difficult for them to do that uh, that's kind of the genesis of this. We knew we had one shot to really try to bring this industry back into a modern framework, and we had to do it correctly. And so you'll kind of see wh where we are. Um, so now I'm going to show you the really sad, I, I guess I always say, like, first I'll make you cry, and then I'll make you laugh. But uh, So I'm going to show you some data. Um, one of my good friends at the FAA kind of turned <coughs> me on to this, and he's in the room today. He said, Greg, you should look at tower operations for GA over the last 20 years and it doesn't look so great. So here's what we did is we went and looked at tower operations over the last 20 years and we plotted that for you. So over the first um, six years, so from 94 to 2000, unremarkable, I mean some up, some down, nothing special there. Uh, and in 2000 the FA predicted we'll see 3% growth. That was the prediction um, at the time based on the economy and where things were headed. In reality we saw a decline to 2006. And again, the FA predicted 3% growth and then uh, decline, and then actually 4% growth in 2008. <laughs> and then uh, well, the reality of the situation is that. So um, every year we've been in decline. Every year there's been this a prediction one of the really good growth. ones, though. So the FA has been measuring private pilot count since 1965 um, and age distribution. So this is really kind of an interesting thing. If you look at the distribution of age of the typical private pilot back in 1965, 
I would say that's a really healthy distribution. You got in the middle of life, the most pilots, and then an even distribution, young guys coming up, older guys going away. It's kind of the typical, you know, society is engaged in this activity in their prime years. Um, and then uh, as, as this goes on, so what we've done is we kind of animated it. You'll see post-Vietnam, you have the GI Bill, a lot of young pilots came in. And they kind of went through the system. And then watch at this high end here. What's interesting is the 60 to 64, right? That, there's so many, the FAA reaccounts and spills it over because we got to start getting so many older pilots, which is wonderful. Um, but we're not getting younger pilots, which is problematic as well. And so uh, if you look from the high, which was in the 80s, we had about 360-some thousand private pilots in the US. Today, there are around 180,000 pilots, uh, private pilots in the US. And once we kind of push this lump of older pilots against that line of can't quite work the yoke anymore, I guess, because we're getting too old, um, we'll have around 120,000. So that's just a depressing data point. Uh, Unless maybe you're a young pilot, and there's maybe two airplanes for every pilot. I don't know, that's interesting. Um, another data slice for you to think about here. This is long, long-term accident plot. This is just count-based. It's not rate-based. I do have a rate-based slide I'll show you, but unfortunately, rate-based data is just in the last decade. So this goes way back. A couple things I want you to take away from this. Two important concepts I take away from this. Number one. Accidents happen a lot more often than fatal accidents. And I try to think about that. We need to focus, in my opinion, on fatal accidents. It's the most important segment for us as engineers to think about. And I kind of draw a parallel to the automotive world. In the car world, if someone crashes into me in the parking lot and I get a dented car, um, that's a bad day. But I'm not going to call Ford and say, like, you need to design this car differently. People are bumping into me in parking lots. I'm getting dented bumpers. It's a bad day. Uh, and if we want to improve that, we can, but that's on our own, right? But if someone bumps into me in the, in the parking lot and I die, that is unacceptable, right? Or I'm seriously injured. We got to fix that. And so that's why fatal, I don't ever want to let fatal accidents get buried by the other data. We really need to pay attention to the fatal stuff. And sometimes just by looking at raw counts of accidents, we can get distracted from what's important because the things you'll see in accidents are very different than the things you'll see in fatal accidents. What is, a fa what is causing fatal accidents is very specific. And things that are just causing accidents you know, if we try to solve accidents, we don't save lives necessarily. And that's, and that's what I think today in our world, this is where we need to be. The second thing I want, to take, want you to think about is, look how stable that system is. Most engineers in the room, like, I think we're all engineers, yeah? So 50 years of like a very, very, very stable system. So how do I disrupt a stable system with like a little tiny tweak to a regulation? If I take 1309 and add a decimal place and make it 10 to the minus 10th, does that like, fix that problem? No, it doesn't. So that was the other thing we're looking at here is like we have a very significant, stable, long-term accident trend that we need to understand and intervene in a new, bold way. Because if we do the traditional things, we'll get the traditional results, nice, stable rates. Another data point, um, this is the production of airplanes around the world, Part 23 airplanes around the world. So used to build a lot of them back in the 70s. And so you'll see that um, the piston airplanes went into pretty significant decline, a little bit of rebound after GARA in 1994. Uh, but what did start to happen as well is we saw a lot more turbofans and um, turboprops coming into the segment. And so um, that's just another thing to think about. As new kinds of airplanes came along, the FAA had to create new <coughs> regulations. Making that patchwork had an interesting effect. And so we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, the other interesting data point here is the average airplane is 48 years old, or actually I think it's 50 now. I made these a couple years ago. So, so the, the average airplane is roughly world, 50 right? years old. It's crazy. Um, if that was automotive, how would people get around? Most people ride the bus, right? They'd ride the Airbus or the Boeing, and that's what happens here today. So we've kind of lost touch with uh, society um, in a certain regard. So here's what we're talking about today. Part 23, it's up to 19,000 pounds, 19 passengers. Um, within that, we have turboprops, turbofans, and piston aircraft. So a broad range of vehicles in there spanning a big range of things and one regulatory part. Part 25 
has a bigger span of vehicles, but I would bet we see a lot more similarity, right? They're almost all pressurized, they're almost all turbine aircraft, and they're just bigger or smaller stretches for the most part. I don't mean to insult, they're incredible products, but uh, the, regula the regulations fit pretty well for those kinds of vehicles. And then in part 23, you got a lot going on and even more coming in. So trying to have one set of very prescriptive regulations deal with all that stuff is problematic. And that's where the FAA had been stuck. You know, that, that's all they had as a tool for a long time. Introductions of brand new four seat entry level airplanes. So what you'll see here is, um, first of all, the price went up. This is not completely due to certification costs at all. It's due to liability, it's due to production costs, it's due to a whole lot of factors. Um, nonetheless, uh, there is a quote in that study that Pat mentioned that basically says, between 94 and 96, there were 800 regulatory changes to Part 23 enacted um, that made it more costly to certify a simple airplane. Essentially, the regulatory scope of Part 23 had been shifted to more directly address complex airplanes to the detriment of simple. So well-intended rules came in to address more complex growing airplanes, but they were written in a way that was as the rest of the regulations. They were specific. They were based on things like if it's above 6,000 pounds, it's this. If it's below, it's that. Trends of the time that would obviously evolve as we went forward, right? And so the, the tools that we're about to talk about weren't necessary then because it was the age of where we were. But now we're in a very different place. And, and so these tools that we're about to talk about are going to be really critical to us. So I don't think I have to point. I think I don't think I can laser point. So I'm going to cut right to the chase, and then these guys will explain in more depth. But mm -hmm. if you look at the historic part 23, what you'll find is you have um, subparts, right? Subpart A, B, C, D. We know the subparts. So for example, let's pretend this is subpart B, flight test. The introduction section says that the aircraft needs to be flight tested. You need to capture the um, operating envelope and make sure that you limit operations within that operating envelope, right? And then there's a whole bunch of detail about how to measure stall speed at a one, one per second uh, degradation um, with power at idle. Oh, I think it says power, the old rule said power at idle. I can't remember exactly how it said it, but flight idle, something like that. But, it, but a good way to do that in the exact product of the time. But then you have folks say, well, what if I have a flight idle that raises that power up and I kind of, kind of, can I gain that test if I have a flight idle that's really powerful? And the FAA has to start contemplating all those things and they have to give you an exemption or a special condition. And so every project became a bit of a science project. If you wanted to do anything outside of that 1960s model, you had to spend a lot of time and effort getting your path. You'd spend a year or two writing what you were gonna do, coming to agreement, putting that in stone, and it was only good for that one project. And if you wanted to do it again on a new project, you would spend another year or two coming to agreement on what that path was, putting it in stone, and that wasted the industry's time, it wasted the FAA's time, um, and that was the process. And that's the process everywhere else in the FAA right now. So what's happened is this. Those high-level safety objectives have been retained, and those details have moved to industry consensus standards. So exactly how you do it is a means of compliance. So you still need to make sure that the aircraft has a safe operating envelope and that you portray those limitations and the aircraft is operated within it. And then there are, there are far more details than that, in fact, in the rules. But all the details of how you do the one uh, knot per second degradation to get onto stall speed, that's in the standard. And if there's a, another way, if there's an aircraft that is electric, for example, and can go to zero thrust, or maybe there's a blown wing aircraft that will never go to zero thrust, you can address that in the standards much more quickly. And the FA, only the FA, can accept those standards as means of compliance. So the FA still has that ability to make sure you're doing things safely and properly. But once they come to agreement in the standard, you can use that forevermore on a whole range of projects. So they've done the same work once, and now it gets leveraged everywhere. So here's what that looks like. Uh, 377 regulations became 71. And those are bolstered, bolstered by standards that are the means of compliance. The current standards contain essentially everything you've done in Part 23 to date. They are almost a transposition with some cleanup. There were some errors in Part 23 that were very quickly cleaned up. Uh, there were some verbiage that was confusing that was cleaned up. But essentially what you could do yesterday, you can do today under the standards. And there have been some new additions. There have been some new things added to give you new paths for new technology. 
when new technology comes through, the concern would be, well, what if, what if somebody tries to do something crazy? Well, only the FAA can approve that path. So it's not like you can go out and say, I'm doing something crazy because this new flexibility is here. Until the FAA says that is an acceptable path to us, it's not a path. So it's the same folks, the same smart folks doing the same work they've done, putting those standards into place in a much faster way, much less bureaucratic way, so that we can all leverage them. Yes, sir. So what are these consensus standards, such as SAE? So is that what you're, that what you're referring to? So those are types of consensus standards. So SAE, um, RTCA, ASTM, Euro K, those are consensus standards. Okay. So we as an industry decided a bunch of years back that we, when we were doing the Part 23, that we needed to stand up a volume of all the stuff we've done historically into standards, so we had this framework. And so we did that work under ASTM. And so there's a group called ASTM F44 where we kind of stood up those high-level rules. But then, in addition, all the SAE seats rules and lightning rules, and as new things come online, it's much more quick to adopt those into this framework. So just kind of, I think you get where we are, but here's the timeline of how that all happened. Pat did a great job describing the small airplane process study. We had the Part 23 ARC. Um, there was the US, uh, U.S. Congress put through the Small Aircraft Revitalization Act in 2013, kind of encouraging this activity. Um, at that point in time, in EASA, a parallel effort was stood up, and I spent three years over there helping <laughs> make sure we were on a common framework with, with um, Europe. Part 23 rule was put into place uh, at the very end of 2016, and um, EASA's final decision was issued at, uh, in April, in, or maybe it was March 30th, something like that. Um, and so both of these rules go into effect on, let's see, U.S. is August 31st mm -hmm. this year, 2017. You can begin using these rules. And by the way, if you ask nicely, the FAA will let you get going right now, mm -hmm. assuming you're not going to certify in time um, by then. But, but the, you, on that day, you can theoretically type certify a product to the new rules. Um, and in Europe, uh, it's August 15th. So uh, the Europeans have beat the FAA by 15 days. Mm -hmm. so I'm sorry to say. So if it's okay, maybe I'll delve into where our safety statistics are, and then I'll pass it over to Lowell. So if you look at accidents by operational type, Part 91 is the vast majority of fatal accidents, uh, and then 135 and Part 90, uh, 121. Here is where those fatal accidents are occurring. Um, number one, loss of control. And this is GA, JSC data, really awesome group of folks that is helping us all along the way. It includes NTSB, FAA, industry. I think it's chaired by AOPA um, right now. Uh, so number one, loss of control, fatal accidents. Basically half of fatal accidents Number two is CFIT, control flight and terrain. Then systems and component power plant failure. Then fuel, that's literally just running out of gas. Uh, unknown, mid-air collision, low altitude maneuvering, don't have a code for it, other, so on and so forth. So on this slide, a couple, a lot to take away. Um, we talked about, if you remember when I showed you that super stable fatal accident curve, so, and I said like, hey, what's it take to disrupt a fatal accident curve that stable? So here's, here's a question for you. If I want to write a rule about um, loss of control on ground fatalities, right? If I want to say, hey, I'm going to work on mandating anti-skid brakes, uh, and I do that, and I mandate it, everyone has anti-skid brakes, and we all spent a ton of money on it, and we never, ever have another loss of control on the ground accident again, <coughs> none of us would ever know we did anything for safety, right? And that's why this chart is so important, because we have to say, if I'm like, if I do something for loss of control, and I'm like 10% effective, like, ah, oh man, it, was, it wasn't great, but it was mildly effective, that was like the biggest safety innovation of our time. So that's why this chart is so important. We have to know where things are happening, how we can save lives, right? And we have statistical data to look at. And that's so I will say this. We've done a deep dive now into loss of control to see what's happening there. We've done a deep dive into systems and component power plant to see what's happening there and a deep dive into fuel to see what's happening there. And I'm going to show you why we didn't do a deep dive into CFIT yet in a second. Um, but what was interesting about fuel was when we looked into systems and component power plant and fuel, it turned out there were a lot of miscoded accidents. And we thought fuel was a lot lower fatality for decades than it actually is. It turns out that running out of gas is the fourth fatal cause of accidents. Uh, we didn't know that until just this last year. It was miscoded until we did the deep dive. It turns out the other propulsion ones were going past TVO, which is recommended, but not doing maintenance past TVO, and then um, maintenance issues were the key causes to fatal accidents, to fatal accidents for propulsion power plant. So uh, just as an aside, when, when, this, when this information was identified, the fueling accident issue was identified, um, we had been kind of in close contact with GAJSC. 
happened that they formalized this data on the very same day we were having an ASTM meeting talking about our standards for fuel. We sat and all discussed it as a group of experts, and we kind of said, hey, fourth cause of fatal accidents is people running out of gas. We have data that shows that airplanes that have a fuel identification light, low fuel identification light, or a fuel range ring don't suffer these accidents. The NTSB has been making these recommendations for 40 years. What do you guys think? Should we just say that this is the base requirement for means of compliance through ASTM? And everyone said, yes, we do. And so that is now the base means of compliance through ASTM. If you want to comply with the standard, which is the means of compliance for new, new designs, you're going to have a fuel identification light in there when you're at 30 minutes in the tank. And the criticality of that light will be based on the criticality of being out of fuel. So if you're in a motor glider, the light comes on, it doesn't really matter. So it doesn't have to have higher robustness because it doesn't matter. It might be a little white light. If you're in a turbine aircraft and the 30 minute light comes on and you need a good airport to land because you don't have um, 61 knot stall speed, <coughs> that's a warning issue. And so the criticality is based upon the impact of low fuel on an aircraft. So that's the power of standards. It really lets us kind of deal with that in just the right light. So those loss of control accidents are very frustrating. Um, when we did the deep dive, it turns out most of them are happening during daytime VFR and the traffic pattern in those two places, base to final turn and right at takeoff. So that is like exactly what we trained ourselves not to do, right? Recognize slow flight, don't stall spin, uh, and unfortunately, it's just what we do. We're humans, right? So we're seeing those accidents. Um, it's below the spin recovery altitude. So the 1,000 foot spin recovery that most aircrafts require, um, you're not there. And so uh, this is the result, right? So there we are. So the new rule that Lowell's going to walk through doesn't actually allow spin recovery as a means of compliance for um, loss of control in the future, unless you're aerobatic. So airplane, aerobatic airplanes can do spin recovery. Non-aerobatic need to be defended against loss of control. And we'll talk about what that looks like. It's a layered approach to, to preventing loss of control. It's not the traditional full spin resistance uh, demonstration that we've seen. That is a path. But there are some other very clever paths being developed right now that, that are a layered approach to technology and docile characteristics um, that will really move this stuff forward. So I want you to think about that. Like, if we are able to get a world where we don't have these high energy crashes anymore, right? We don't have high energy crashes anymore because we've gotten rid of loss of control, and maybe we get rid of CFIT then everything else is a crash around stall speed. And that's why we're talking about crash worthiness. Because if we can build a level of crash worthiness so around stall speed, everyone walks away, we have a remarkably safe industry. And so that's where we would want to get ourselves. So CFIT. And this is a, a bit of a dotted line, but we love those. So, does anyone know what happened in 2004? What mandatory, between 2004 and 2005, what was the FAA mandate that was put through uh, around CFIT? No, nothing. That's right, nothing. <laughs> and uh, does it, so what happened in that time frame is the handheld Garmin GPS and iPads started coming online, and the MX-20 non, not for primary flight displays started coming out, and all that equipment had a huge effect on safety. So CFIT, because it was non-required carrying <coughs> equipment, people started to do it. They started to know where terrain was. And because the non not for primary flight displays started getting prolific, people stopped crashing into things. And that is a huge lesson for us, right? People want to live. We all want to live. We want to have this information. And often the certification thresholds have been preventing that stuff from getting in the cockpit. But because it was carry-on, it got in and it saved lives. And so that is important, right? So you kind of say, well, what can we carry on for loss of control? Well, that's kind of a short-sighted question, right? Maybe we just fix it so you don't need to carry it on. Like, let's make the installation requirements more appropriate so you can install stuff that saves lives, and it's the right price, and you get it in the aircraft. So that's where we've headed. So with these new rules, um, the things that I think are most exciting Loss of control, so this layered approach to loss of control. Number one, I think every time I talk to somebody about AOA, I agree with you first of all. In the back of your head, you're saying, AOA is bogus, it doesn't save lives. I call AOA a bronze bullet. So um, I say that because if I put AOA in the plane of an accident pilot the hour before he's gonna crash, 
he probably would still have that loss of control accident. Probably was saturated in tasks, wouldn't necessarily notice the AOA was telling him what it, or her what it was telling him. But if I gave that pilot that AOA when they were learning to fly, and they started to pull back on the yoke and go, wow, look at it load up, and oh, look at it unload, and when I'm in the bank, look how it loads, and really got a sense for that airplane, and when it's loaded, and when it's unloaded, and how you can innately react to those kinds of characteristics, I believe that pilot will probably not get in that situation. And so um, that's why I think AOA is a wonderful device. And we can also do some other wonderful things with it that are even better. So just a raw display of AOA is interesting, but when you start to do other things, like maybe we drive the, the impending loss of control based on the trend of AOA, maybe we, drive, maybe we start to use that for better envelope protection. I mean, there's some really cool things that get enabled by AOA and even just by other things. So, so you can see where things are headed. Um, Nick Bohr from NASA is, is chairing a task group that's writing a standard, the layered approach to loss of control, and it's pretty awesome. Um, the way it works is it's a point system. So you need to attain 200 points, and you attain those points in different categories. So basically the first thing is, how docile is your airplane in loss of control? So you use some traditional loss of control, departure control scenarios, and you determine how docile it is. And you can get up to 100 points if it's extremely docile. Uh, and you get far less if it's not so docile. And then based on the stall warning you have. If you have a very robust, well-known stall warning, you get more points versus if you have something that's not so prolific. And we've got some great data that shows a constant horn stall is the least attention getting <laughs> during periods of high, active, uh, of high saturation. And the next above that is a broken tone. So that, 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 that is actually 10% better in getting your attention in studies than the constant tone. And a voice tone is 10% better than that. So you get more points for a voice tone than you do for a constant tone, right? So constant tone stall is going to get you minimum. Broken tone is going to get you a little more. Voice will get you a little more. And then next is we found that tactile feedback is far better than audio in those kind of scenarios. So vibrating the stick or vibrating the seat gets you more points. And so these are the things. These kinds of layered approaches, envelope protection gets you a chunk of points. So these technologies that can mitigate loss of control, layered on top of each other, get you above and that. What's pressure. amazing about this path is none of those have to be level A or B or even C systems, right? Because all of them separately can be low integrity uh, because it's the stack up that gets us where we need to be. So therefore, they can be low cost, easy, retrofitable equipment. And I already mentioned crashworthiness. So electric propulsion, um, I just wanted to highlight a couple things. Uh, Last year, if we showed you how to certify electric and hybrid aircraft, this is what that chart looked like. Europe had a hope in the sport world, and, and China had a hope in the sport world. Um, this year, uh, this is what the chart looks like. So part 23 enables electric and hybrid propulsion. Um, we need the appropriate standards and means of compliance, and those are being actively developed right now. Uh, but that's a pretty big deal. So these new rule sets enable that. Um, and I'm going to talk about a little more bold stuff in a second, too. We're also working with Engine and Propeller Directorate on, on this. And Gamma has a site activity where we're doing electric and hybrid uh, propulsion work and increased automation work. So increased automation, Pat alluded to the Uber Elevate conference. And I wanted to kind of show you all an um, uh, interesting tangent where things are going pretty quick, just because we all had the chance to be there a couple weeks back. And it was really interesting, eye-opening. and. Um, what you saw in the press was wild in some cases. Some of it was very accurate, some of it was wildly inaccurate. Uh, so you have to start to think about how the world has changed, right? We all have these mobile devices now, um, and our world is totally different than it was for our fathers or grandfathers. Um, most folks aren't reading newspapers, most folks aren't uh, sitting at a desk with a rotary phone anymore. Um, the big fundamental shift that's on its way is drive is automation in cars, right? So all the big car companies are predicting in the next few years, uh, automation is a much more common part of our life. Um, whether that be the next three, five, or six, or seven years, it's probably coming in some form or fashion. And I just saw a study in 2030, most companies are saying that they may not, um, the car dealerships may go by the wayside, and it's probably not a good time to invest <coughs> in Ford or Chrysler unless they get automated, uh, because car ownership probably goes away and people have contracts. Right, you have a contract for a car instead of a car because you don't need your car in the garage anymore because it drives itself. So it just needs to show up when you need it. Um, so you know, society's shifting, and that's probably not far off from where it's going. With those thoughts in mind, 
uh, the folks in California are far ahead of us, and so this is where um, those conversations have gone. Everyone kind of heard about Uber Elevate. So essentially, um, these were the characteristics that uh, Uber indicated they were looking for. They'd like a vehicle that is two times safer than a car, 15 to 20 decibels quieter than an existing helicopter, can do vertical takeoff and landing, that's all electric with internal batteries, not, not racked batteries, internal. Um, 60 statute mile range ma uh, minimum, 25 statute mile range average. Uh, with a fast recharge capability, they were hoping for five minutes for that 25 minute range, mile range. Um, 150 miles an hour or faster, three to four passengers, initially single pilot, eventually autonomous. 135 certified, uh, capable, uh, day night, near all weather, and by that they did say they didn't mean icing initially. <laughs> so, um, but basically, I have that. <laughs> I'd like to do is continue on with what Greg started, okay, and then um, we'll get into the final rule discussion. I'm going to talk top level, give you kind of, we'll go from broad to specific where we get into um, uh, mainly subpart A and then s some examples. So continuing on with what Greg had started on why we're doing this, obviously for the FAA it's safety. And frankly, if we just get some new low-end 23 airplanes, the, the safety level they'll come out with because of what the market demands will be so much higher than what we're flying today. And as Greg pointed out, the airplanes I'm renting, uh, actually, actually I have a slide because the 150 I'm renting is older than the 152 that I soloed in at 16. And, and you can tell that was decades ago. So that's kind of the state of the industry. Um, we're certifying more, we're registering more experimental and LSA aircraft than we are Part 23 annually. That's been going on for a number of years. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, we had a problem to fix, and, and that's a big part of this. But the focus was on the low end, okay? Um, the, the top end of 23 really ends up being in a pretty good place and industry was pretty happy with it. But the stepping stone from the bottom end into 23 was huge. Basically you needed to be a turbine product to have a chance at making money in 23. So we, we're trying to address that. Um, so included in this, you know, we're trying to get new technology into the existing airplanes as well as new airplanes. Uh, the consensus standard Recommendations that came out of the ARC were a big player here. We put that in. Uh, the agility with new technology is a big deal. And I, I know I'm living and have lived for about 25 years this issue that something new comes in, we have to do an issue paper for it, have to do special conditions. We really want the agility to deal with new technology. And we haven't had a new airplane, no matter how simple that hasn't needed something, a special condition, an equivalent level of safety, because we just can't deal with the technology. The rules were based in the 80s and prior. But if we step back and we look big picture, we've been talking safety continuum for quite a while. And the idea of that is that we take our least amount of risk at, at the top end. And as <coughs> all of us who fly on the airlines we want that, we want a level of safety up there that they have today, which is almost perfect. It's amazing, the, the level of safety we get in the transport world. If we try to impose that on a two-place airplane, it's gone. The only way to do it is to ground it. So you have to have this concept of a safety continuum. And that kind of took hold over the last decade within the FAA. Uh, so the, the Part 23 effort capitalizes on that where we're going risk-based in this new, uh, well, the rules are called performance-based. That means we look at risk and we look at the airplane's performance. They're very top level. What we were trying to do was to capture the general safety requirement that our very prescriptive rules have asked for over the years. It was, it was an interesting challenge. 
But fundamentally, that's what we want in the FAA, is that top level safety for whoever's operating the airplane. We're trying to diminish the workarounds, which we have on virtually every airplane, every new airplane today. And even a lot of the STCs, we're dealing in that. Uh, you guys that work in projects know exactly what I mean. And then there's a little bit of marketing with this too. Uh, both inside and outside of the FAA. This is such a major change. I mean, it's an opportunity to, that, that we're offering is give us a try, bring your new technology to us. So there's a, a little bit of that also. But one of the things Greg pointed out in the 90s, we added roughly, we made changes to roughly 800 sections in part 23. Well, when we went from the cars to the FARs, every 10 years we were supposed to do a very thorough review of the rules and update them. The last major rule change for 23 was in 1984, a long time ago. Those changes didn't get into 23 until the mid-90s. So you can see, to get things into 23, these efforts take 10 years. And I mean, Greg and I started in 07 on this one. Uh, one, of, one of the problems for Part 23 that's unique to us is we have very little priority. So for us, the whole rulemaking process is almost broken because you come in with a new product or a new technology, we're not going to get it codified in the rules forever. Uh, the, only, the only part, the only flying machine that has a lower priority in rulemaking than us is balloons, Part 31. And they literally haven't had a change in decades. Uh, and, and we anticipate not having a change in decades, too, once we get our final product done, which hopefully is the end of this year. Um, so, so a little example, we were still doing special conditions for jets up until 2012 when we got kind of a mid-scale rule change through that included jets. And, and most of that was because of the, um, the priority that flight standards made for the fractionals. And it gave us some attention, put us in the spotlight. We got a little bit of priority. We made a few changes for jets uh, in 2012. Now, Part 11 says special conditions are for new and novel technologies. I would kind of offer that perhaps business jets aren't new and novel technologies. Um, and a lot of you, I don't know, you guys know the Paris jet? Anybody? I had a chance to ride one, pretty cool. 58. And then, of course, you know the Learjet. That was our first Part 23 jet. So, a little bit broken. So, so from our office and the FAA internally, we've really wanted this rule change. But we've had a lot of external support, too. And, um, and I'm not going to steal Steve's thunder. He's got a lot more detail, but I want to show you that um, there's a Modernization and Reform Act, but more importantly, the Small Airplane Revitalization Act got a lot of support from Congress down through the administration, down to the uh, Secretary of Transportation. So that really gave us that outside priority to get this done. And, and we appreciate it, too. So, so the other side of it, I talked about safety. How do we get safety? Right now, the market's driving safety. If we can just get some new products in, it'll make a big difference. But the other side of that is, um, and some of the larger established companies pointed this out, if it's not in the rule and if they bring in new safety technology and it requires a special condition, they're not going to do it because a special condition is a risk to them. It's a schedule risk. And, and schedule is time and time is money. Very hard to encourage people to put new technology in their airplane and then come along with, we just have to do about 45 pages of um, special conditions for you. Don't worry, it'll only take a year. Really goes over well. This is, this is a very popular light sport, and I'd just like to highlight they have no, no crashworthiness requirements per se, 
in light sport, and yet this airplane has not only a roll cage, but some dynamic seat work. It has, uh, and, and granted, this was all done analytically through modeling, but some crushable structure and a ballistic recovery chute because the market wants it. These are, are things you can market to people and they will pay for. And that wasn't true 10 years ago, to be honest with you. The GA community is kind of slow to accept the concept of safety. And I actually ended up putting shoulder harnesses in the plane I rent. I made a deal with the FBO because most of the renters just accept that it doesn't have shoulder harnesses. And I'm thinking that's probably one of the most important safety features for a little airplane you can get. The adaptability and agility is another big one, and uh, but both um, uh, Pat and Greg showed you some of these machines. But 23 today was based on 50-year-old, 80-year-old technology. We need the adaptability. And here's, I don't, I don't know if any of you have actually thought about this, but in CAR 3 wasn't that far off. It was a fairly top level rule. The original 03 and 38 started off fairly top level. But the assumptions were that airplanes would be, have to be inherently stable. Okay, so that drove configuration. And that the engines had basically a power to weight ratio that the, the piston engines still do today. And that also drove configuration. So the rules were fairly simple, but they were configuration based because, let's face it, nothing was going to change. And it hadn't changed until really the, uh, the toys, the drones, etc., brought the price of flight control systems down. And, and now with electric and the power to weight on those devices, we have the capability uh, of doing some really cool things with airframes with shapes. They're not going to be conventional anymore. And 23 could not handle that. So I'm going to delve into just a little more detail. And you're, you're probably saying, Lowell, um, what's a B-29 have to do with part 23? And uh, two, two things. My dad flew it, and it's a really cool picture. <laughs> and, they're, and they're my slides, so I get to put the pictures up. So what came out of the reorganization arc, and, and Greg kind of already took some of this and shared it with you. It's, the big ones were we need to um, go to a safety performance base. And I, I'm going to use the term risk performance based rule process and get away from weight and propulsion. Because currently part 23, yes, currently it's still divided by weight and propulsion. Okay. Uh, the other was to move the prescriptive details in 23 into means of compliance. And you know a lot of, like, like my subpart B, I will have a very general rule that says you have to meet the stability requirements or the airplane has to be stable and you have to meet the requirements in the next five sections. And then the next five sections tell you specifically how to configure the airplane and do the flight test, which honestly is, really belongs in guidance material. Okay. The other uh, big one is we eliminated the categories. Part 23 now is just normal category. And when we first started that, that, that bothered people. But as we've gone along with, I think people talk to each other, phones, internet, uh, because that seems to not be a problem with, with anybody anymore. So. If you have questions, I would answer them, like about commuter. Otherwise, I'm going to keep going. The, the big one is we expanded the scope of 23 down to include CSVLA, the European uh, light aircraft requirement, very light aircraft requirement. Again, to address what I was talking about, we would like to have a stepping stone and make 23 more accessible for light sport and move them into a certified airplane and get them into a more substantial <coughs> airframe and out of the 1320 gross weight limitation. 
So there's a big push for that in the new rule. The, uh, that first bullet is key. And it ties to what was brought up earlier on uh, raising the level of safety or noticing the ASTM documents. So the FAA said when we were at Amendment 62 and with this rulemaking that the new rule would maintain the level of safety that we have today in Amendment 62 except for the areas of loss of control and icing. And that's it. Um, so, so no matter how it reads or what it looks like or the concerns, the intent was never to raise the level of safety. Because as you saw with, with Greg's chart, today the level of safety in virtually everything in 23 is adequate. Our problem is loss of control. If we can prevent loss of control in 90% of the situations in the new airplanes, we will have cut the accident rate in half in the new airplanes. It's really simple. That's what kills people, are stall-related accidents. If we fix that, and everybody agreed, I mean, back to the CERT process study, this will cost more for applicants. It is, it is uh, an increased level of safety and an increased burden. Um, but the belief is that you're going to get cost savings elsewhere. We also don't require spin recovery anymore. That testing is expensive and it's gone. We think you're still going to end up spending a little less on the TC, but we're going to get a huge increase in safety. And that's the win-win. And we don't always get to work on win-win. So it's kind of excited, this <coughs> exciting, this rulemaking, in that it, it was something industry wanted and something the FAA wanted. Oh, and the other thing that has been a big concern almost in every office that we've gone to, we did not get rid of our prescriptive requirements. All the language and the requirements that you're used to seeing are still there. They have just moved to means of compliance. Greg talked a little bit about that this morning. Uh, industry elected uh, to use ASTM, so that's where they are. And in some places they've been tweaked because we corrected errors, and in others um, we fixed a few things. I wanted to show this slide just to let you know that this was, this was not just an FAA project, but EASA ran a parallel path with us. This was a joint project with rulemaking-wise with EASA and the FAA, uh, as well as a whole bunch of other foreign authorities. So it's a very international project. Um, and it worked pretty well. I'd say we're 85 percent there. It's hard to make this work perfect when our, our process is a closed process. Greg already gave you some dates. I'll just uh, reinforce December for the rule. Uh, it, it's effective August 30th. As Greg said, we are, we are trying to work projects ahead of time, mainly to find out uh, if we need to fix anything, uh, I, I, you know, and, and I know that you're saying, but how could you guys not have a perfect product when it came out the first round? But you never know; there could be a problem with it. Uh, and I'm being sarcastic. It was fast. It was a major change. To think there's nothing wrong with it probably would be um, uh, it, not not too bright. So. We would like to work through some projects and see if we need a fix. We already have a spot rule change in, in the works. And uh, I will also offer that EASA is doing the same thing. They call it a refresh. They're planning the same thing, both to harmonize and to fix any problems. Um, the AC, which defines how to deal with means of compliance, is out. Uh, ASTM standards look like they're on track for August to line up with the rule. and. Um, I think that's it. As Greg said, EASA published theirs uh, March 30th, and we were over for that. We were still working harmonization issues with them. Fundamentally the same uh, material that we're, we're uh, doing for the ACOs, of which we've got one left. So we've done nine ACO presentations, one headquarters presentation, 
and you're basically getting the, the same workshop series that they are. Um, and, and our main objective is to try to give you differences training. Now we won't do the work, the uh, exercises here, but I don't, um, we can talk about them if you're interested. All we do is use that so that people can sit down with their specialists and kind of get some one-on-one -on -one time so that when they have a problem, they know who to call and they have a comfort level. So the hope is that you'll understand what's different from today with the new rule, um, that you'll understand how options, what, what's out there, how options work. Steve's got quite a lot on ASTM, it's excellent. Uh, he'll go through that. Um, also, I'll show you where to go and how to develop new means of compliance or how that might work. Very top level and that's all part of the uh, AC 2010. Also, mixing amendment levels, there really isn't a whole lot to show you. It's not any different than today. You know, um, an airplane like a Skyhawk probably has every amendment level in its, on the TC data sheet somewhere. And now you're just going to have 23 amendment 64 for whatever sections you use. Um, I definitely want to show you how the means of compliance work instead of special condition and ELOSs because we talked about that. Uh, those questions came up with Greg. I've got a couple slides to give you examples. And then the DER tr uh, training has already been modified to include this. There's not a lot there. We've, we've been engaged with Oklahoma City on this for about 18 months and uh, they gave us some slides that, <coughs> that Steve has put in his, but fundamentally it's there's very little change. We just, I say that, we're all going to have to get used to where to find the details. That, that's the change. Otherwise, it, it's not too big a deal. I went back. All right, so, so we've already driven home. The level of safety stays the same, except for loss of control. For singles, the new requirements are that uh, they do not have a tendency to depart. So big picture, today, you can use a stick pusher. It's a barrier. You can do spin resistance. That's aerodynamic. Those two options still exist to, in the, in the, um, to meet this. They are also, they exist in ASTM. What we're looking for is something kind of in the middle that uses an aerodynamic solution, a system solution, and then new technology solution. And I see three to four columns, uh, which is what Gr Greg told you, you know, you're going to have enhanced characteristics, then you may have better warning, then you may have some type of passive or active envelope protection. What, what's interesting is the uh, group right now is really wrestling with the matrix that they fly and if the airplane departs, what percentage is acceptable? And we're kind of landing on 5 to 10 percent. So if the airplane can basically do a whole abuse stall characteristics test, but a couple of them, it departs. They, there's a couple camps. They want to give credit for recovery, um, or they want to require a ballistic parachute if it doesn't recover. So we, we don't want to incentivize manufacturers to go the spin recovery route. Definitely, it doesn't meet the intent of the rule. However, all of us, um, me included, like the idea of knowing if it'll recover. So it's, it's um, right now we're trying to find that balance of how do you incentivize, but just on a lower level, or not, not de-incentivize somebody to recover. On this point, so light twins is another area you see a lot of accidents in light twins where after one engine fails, they try to stretch the, they try to get to an airport, and the airplane does not want to fly level and uh, the airplane will depart. So I, I will be interested to see what industry comes up with here because they actually drove this requirement. This was an industry recommendation put into the rule. 
they're not working on that yet. We did delete the one turn spin requirement in normal. The reason is if you really work hard on the handling characteristics on the front side, it hurts spin recovery. And to some extent, and this was tried in the 70s, airplanes had to back off of some of the stall characteristic handling and make it a little worse because they couldn't meet that one turn spin recovery. So because of the trade-off, the FAA said it's a choice. You know, we can't have both. We want, we want to look at the front side of this. Uh, the one I'm excited about is removing the specifics from the dynamic seat rule. And, and Greg started talking about it, and I'd, I'd offer the concept is great. The test is what's bad. The test looks at a level of precision that is so high, it's very expensive. And it completely negates the idea that we can't train the pilots to crash that way. They're just an untrainable bunch of folks. So if we can come up with using some of the automotive technology and maybe instead of doing an expensive test allow for some of the modeling because modeling is getting really good they still have a dynamic seat we just don't have that expensive test and honestly if that dynamic seats within 20 or 30 percent of that high level of precision that's close enough because as soon as you get in if you don't weigh 170 pounds the seats not going to work right for you and if you don't crash exactly right, that seat's not going to work for you. So that's, that's why I'm excited about this rule. This rule is focusing on occupant protection, not a dynamic seat. So it didn't change the level of safety, and I'll be honest with you, they're wrestling with this. If you hit the street today and ask us what to do, we'd point you to the dynamic seat rule. I just hope that this October Crashworthiness Workshop starts getting some ideas going. And then uh, icing. And, and my understanding is basically we codified what we were already doing in the AC. So we didn't expect a you know, cost increase with the new rule. I think it does allow for requirements for SLD, and we didn't have those before. But again, if that's what you wanted to fly in, you would have met what, what we put in the rule. So. It's not really new. So here's a great example of what we think is going to be streamlining. Today, probably a third of our ELOSs are for issues that everybody knows aren't a safety issue. We are so prescriptive in our rules, even today. The throttle has to look this way. The prop has to look this way, the levers that when somebody comes in with a T-handle that looks nice, that obviously works fine, um, or, and we had this at Mooney while I was there, which is late 80s, folks. We had a single power lever. It combined the prop and the throttle. No big deal, right? Doesn't work in the rules. So this took forever. We had to go through the stage four process, publish um, equivalent levels of safety, just so that we could put a T-handle in for a throttle. Just crazy. Under the new rule, can a qualified crew member figure out how to use that? <coughs> and the answer is yes, then you're done. That's it. FADEC is a little different. Uh, we don't have, we, we haven't had requirements for FADEC at all, so we've built special conditions for FADECs, okay? Um, my weed eaters only had FADEX for I don't know how long, but <laughs> so, so, a side note, as a flight guy, I got to look at all the other subparts, and it was really interesting. A, subpart F's electrical systems is probably the, um, the youngest of the technologies. Their rules were the most general. Subpart E for, for um, propulsion, probably the most mature. Uh, of the technologies, especially for piston engine airplanes, piston engines anyway, the most prescriptive rule. We had so much trouble with propulsion because, I mean, it, it was like, well, 
you know, for this engine, you use a Marvel Scheibler carburetor with an AM bolt, and, and it has to be turned this way, and it was so prescriptive, you have to wonder if a little bit of that is why our engines look the same today as they did 60 years ago. Because it was too hard to, to not meet the rules with a new engine. So, FADEC today, though, in the future, all you have to do is come in and say, I want to use these uh, special conditions we've been using as means of compliance. AC and the director agree, and we're done. They're your means of compliance. We don't have to publish in the Federal Register. We don't have to go through all four stages of the back and forth that doesn't take a year. This is how we hope to get streamlining in the process. Now, I, I will tell you that if it's a brand new technology, it helps us a little bit, but we're in the same boat, okay? We still have to build the requirements as means of compliance. So if you're the first one with a new technology, um, it, it's still pretty much the same process. We just don't have to go through the publication aspect of it. It still should take less time and be a little easier for everybody. That's just one of my favorite examples of how prescriptive the rules are. <laughs> so all of that detail in the light rule was really to do what? It was to provide sufficient time so another aircraft could avoid colliding with you. That was the top level safety issue we were trying to solve. Uh, some of these were a lot easier than others. Our guys were tasked to, to try to go through and figure out what the safety requirement was. Is that the, was. the new amendment level? This is the new rule. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and I, I, I believe LEDs are already in a, uh, the means of compliance, so we're done with ELOSs. Those are just some, some concrete examples so that you can see or have a, a feel for what we're talking about when we say streamlining or not having to do special conditions. We still have those tools available to us if we had to, to use them. They're not gone. It's just our goal is to streamline the process on everything. ACs Another issue there, there um, none of the ACs are gone. We still will use them. In a lot of cases, we need to use them. We didn't go through and update all the sections. So all of the old section numbers are still in the ACs. Uh, and, and there is a cross-reference table in the new Part 23 rule that you can use. You can imagine how many things we'd screw up if we'd have tried to update those, if we'd have had time. So it, it makes a lot more sense just to leave them as they are, but they're still valid. The long-term goal with ACs is to uh, eventually roll them into guidance documents that are associated with the ASTM means of compliance, and they have a way to do that. Uh, so again, my slides, my pictures. Uh, these obviously are not Part 23 products, uh, but I'm beginning to think that, that Marty's hoverboard isn't that far off. Anybody see the video of this, this guy flying, right? Have you seen the one where it um, looks like it has six, six little uh, RC model jet engines? That actually looked like it flew better. So the only real thing out of this is what I told you before. For the first time, really in the history of little airplanes, we've got flight control systems and propulsion now that free us up to do all kinds of cool stuff. The 2020s are going to be an exciting time. The cost, I mean, this obviously has some type of stabilization built into it. I know that the jet one had to, too. Uh, do it. <laughs> I know. There's no really way. And they're still, you know, they're still moving them, but they're stable. They've got to be. The cost for a system like that would have been enormous 15, 20 years ago, and today it's a toy. It's just amazing. But, but it's kind of exciting, too. How are we doing? Is everybody okay? 
All right, let's talk about subpart A, and that's pretty much uh, the, the first one. This is the 2000, and uh, you notice we've renumbered. It, it kind of came with the territory. We tried to keep the hundreds in the MPRM and found there was overlap with existing numbers, and that, that wasn't going to work. So by going to 2000, it pushes us out and we don't have any, any numbering confusion. Um, I'm sorry for the new numbers. All of the engineers, including me, wanted to keep the numbers. We fear change. It didn't work. Um, we're finding it's e it, it hasn't been that hard to learn new ones, so I would just offer that. This is the old 23-1. The basic thing here is everything's normal category. That's, that's the big hitter here. Um, and, and normal isn't a big deal, but this is a big change. So I told you before we went away from weight and propulsion. These are the new divisions. It was a challenge because imagine what we were trying to do. We, we needed to maintain pretty much what we did today for legacy airplanes. Um, we didn't want to get too far away. That it, 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 in all fairness, to traditional airplanes, and if you build something that's traditional, we're not going to—they're not going to go away tomorrow. But we also wanted to be relevant for the future too. So this is uh, the 35th or 36th revision of this rule that finally made it through. We elected to use the number of seats, number of passengers. It, it mimics what flight standards does. The assumption is the passengers don't understand the risk. We should take responsibility for risk. Fewer passengers, we can take a higher level of risk as you go higher. And by the time you get to 10 to 19, we are basically at a part 25 level and, and the old commuter category. So when you say passengers, you're not including the crew. Exactly. So the zero could be a two-seater. Or yes, and, and or more. Uh, there could be a special use aircraft. Um, I've we we had one in 30 years that was a two crew, but uh, but it is possible. So yes, two crew, no passengers would be a level one airplane. So this is performance, not to be confused with performance-based rules, but this is just straight performance. So risk, number of passengers, performance, faster than 250, slower than 250. So we have low speed and high speed aircraft. So what you could have today is a, a high speed level one aircraft, like a two place jet, which, which we actually um, had an applicant years ago do that, that uh, could be a high Mach number, very very sophisticated airplane. We didn't have any way to, to work that before. We do now. The new rules put it right where it should be. And I don't have to have special conditions. Uh, so we use c cases like that to build this. The opposite is true too. Before, if it was, if it was over 19, one, and this is kind of a good point, you don't see a restriction over 12.5 now for a multi-engine airplane, you can have a single all the way to 19,000 pounds. But it could be a very simple thing like the ag planes, tube and fabric, low speed, um, very simple airplane. It would get to pick up very simple requirements. And that's what we were, we were trying to hit both of these extremes because prior to this rule, if it had a jet, it was assumed that it was fast and it flew high. And you had to have a special pilot certificate for it because it was, it was a real airplane. If it had a propeller, well, it must fly low and slow and nobody needs special skill. It's, a, it's just a little airplane. And trying to get that mindset changed is a difficult one. It's easier for you guys in the industry, but internally it's, it's kind of a tough one. Uh, as these products show up, our guys are learning, uh, but, but sometimes it's just tough. We've had uh, two proposals for low speed small jets, and low speed meaning less than 200 knots, <coughs> mainly for training. 
<coughs> and, and why not, right? It doesn't need to be treated like a, a Citation 10. This was a big change. It's a new rule, 23-2010. This rule says that to show compliance with 23, you have to use an accepted means of compliance. So this is the hook that we have to look at what you're proposing as means of compliance and accept it or not. So we can say no if you bring something other than what we've already accepted. Uh, a fairly important rule, it also has the AC that um, we've, we've put out. And the attempt there is to kind of give you guidelines on <coughs> how to approach us with means of compliance if you want to do your own, because you're welcome to do your own. And it's really no different than today. What we do want to say is that it may take us a while to look at those. Please don't bring means of compliance to us Friday and expect an answer on Monday. That's happened. So this is, this is a sample compliance checklist. Carrie, this is what you were asking about. We really envision not much changing. You add two columns to this. So here's your, here's the rule, uh, 232200. And then the subparagraph, first column, Second column would be the compliance reference. In this case, in this sample, it's, it's uh, the F44 documents, but it may be Amendment 60, uh, 2362. And then the compliance section, 5.4, if you're using, say, Amendment 62, it could be 23181. And honestly, that's the only difference we see in terms of capturing this. The other thing that we see that's different is TC data sheet. Not a big deal, but you'll need to include, besides the cert basis, the level, and the uh, whether it's high speed or low speed aircraft. So level two, low speed, that needs to be on the TC data sheet. Pretty straightforward. Notes, let's look at those. So the, the question came up, how, how do I know 10 years down the road, if I've got 15 safety devices for dynamic seat, for crash worthiness, how do I know which ones I can modify? Because this thing broke and I want to take it out. Was it required? And under this new system, if I'm using a matrix, a numbering system, that's pretty straightforward. I, I could just add up what's in there, and if I still equal whatever number crash worthiness were to select, I'd be good to go. We're actually going a little bit further and saying that maybe they should be notes on the TC data sheet. So if, say, a ballistic parachute system was just safety enhancing and not required, that should be noted on the TC data sheet. Um, how about gust alleviation? If the airframe met part 23 and the gust alleviation was just uh, an added bonus for the life of the uh, airframe, that's different than if they actually underdesigned the airframe and took credit for gust alleviation. That's a required system. Uh, low speed characteristics, since we're talking about a matrix, it's the same as crash worthiness. We need to know what's required and what's optional. So I, I think that makes sense. Those are the only two changes we see to the TC data sheet under the new system. So 21101 comes up with every ACO we go to because the bulk of our work in the FAA are modifications. And the first thing we have to remind everybody is that applicants do not have to take the latest amendment level for their change. Because there's an assumption that I always have to take the latest amendment level. That's not true. So, so we get through that first, and that is, does it contribute materially to the level of safety? Well, if the new rule 
is maintaining the level of safety of Amendment 62, and you've got a product that's Amendment 62, and there's no benefit, in fact, there's an expense to try and meet Amendment 64, why would you do it? Stay at 62. The other is it's impractical, and it could be that there may be changes to some of the old singles that, frankly, it would be impractical to try to bring them up to Amendment 64 for the loss of control, and you wouldn't want to do that. So what our advice to the ACOs has been leave it at the original. So along those same lines, you know, I, I gave you a couple examples that, that may hold. Um, the larger 23, like some of these late, late model jets, are probably fine right where they are, or up to a 62. Uh, so I shared this as we were with the ACOs, and it was, in my mind, there's not a lot of advantage necessarily unless you find something specific for a technology. Going back to the old planes, um, near term, we have other, we have a fleet modernization effort going on it honestly buys you so much more in terms of getting new equipment on and cost. Uh, long term, we hope that this will help, mainly if you want to refurbish an airplane, a substantial refurbishment. This may help. But, you know, that aside, I'm thinking, for the most part, I don't know the benefits to, um, to jump into the latest amendment for a lot of, of the older airplanes. But we're seeing a whole bunch of really novel approaches already, and, and I'll share with you one that just makes perfect sense. That is um, converting some of the big airplanes, like a King Air 300, to a cargo airplane. Um, our, our projects folks see this happening very quickly. Convert a commuter category to a level one airplane. It's because it's two crew, no passenger, and they can do that. And there may be a reason if it's an old enough airplane that it has some very vintage avionics, you know, to upgrade to a level one qualified avionics system like a G1000, an Avidyne system that's, um, uh, I don't know if there are any left that are only done to, so, to uh, level C, but that would be okay for that airplane. And frankly, it would be a, a safety increase for the kids flying them. Because now they'd have moving maps, traffic, mm -hmm. weather. They'd have a lot of things they don't have on the airplane today. So there's one example that, that in my mind, is a benefit to all of us. Uh, the other is an interesting one. This is a, I want to say it's a travel air, but it may be a Twin Beach. And I can't believe I don't know. It's a travel air, isn't it? So it was a, going to be a, yeah, that's right. Twin Beach has the air steer. So this was going to be a 4,100-pound airplane, but it, back then, CAR-3, prior to Amendment 7, required all airplanes under 4,000 pounds to spin because they were considered personal use and they were, they were expected to be for training. All airplanes over 4,000 pounds didn't have to do anything. Didn't matter about the number of engines. So here's a case where this airplane was going to be a 4,200 pound, or a, I'm sorry, a 3,800 pound airplane. And Beach looked at it and said, we're not going to spin this airplane. So they raised the gross weight to 4,200. Now, wh what's the safety difference between uh, 400 pounds on that airplane? Nothing. But that's the kind of thing you can do when we have divisions of weight. And so, I don't know. Now that the, the weight limit's gone, you may have cases where you can now move, move the weight <laughs> logically without penalizing I just you. want to leave you with some thoughts. Pat already front-loaded this topic, but one of the cool things about going to performance space is it doesn't lock you into configurations. And we tried very hard when we did this to consider new technologies knowing that we're not going to get a new rule through in the next 20 or 30 years. And it's really a tough challenge. The first thing we found is that this NASA airplane, um, what I did in subpart B, wasn't remotely general enough to capture that airplane right off the bat. And I knew it was coming. Um, so we went back and we really did work pretty hard to try to make sure that our rules were general enough to capture 
pardon me, new technology. Um, so today, whether you're doing a 2117 project where you come in and you notice the requirements for it, or a 23 project where you take a cert basis, we've been trying to apply the new rules against some of the the, the power lift, the hybrid lift aircraft that spend most of their time under wingborne lift. For us, that, that'll be the criteria. And we're pretty close. We missed a few places, and we hope to correct that in the spot rule. But we're pretty close. And one of the advantages for us is we don't have to publish all the special conditions for everything that's different. But even under 2117 special uh, class, if you notice simply the top level requirements, like 23, now if you come across something that causes you to change your design, God forbid that would ever happen, um, meaning it's a common occurrence, apologize for the sarcasm, you don't have to re-notice it. You just agree, you just meet with the ACO, you know, this change, these are the new requirements, we agree, we're good to go, we're done. So it's a streamlining, I think, is really going to help the new product. Okay. And that was always the intent, was to have 23 uh, flexible enough to account for all these non-conventional aircraft. Not, not powered lift, um, and, I, and I apologize, this was just too cool not to put on, but it does not have wing-borne lift, <coughs> it would be a rotorcraft project. But we kind of had said if it, if it flies its whole flight, under thrust, powered thrust, uh, powered lift, that's probably a rotorcraft project. But if it takes off vertical and spends most of its life in wingborne lift, then we feel like it could fit under 23. So we want, we want to make sure that the rules aren't 85 percent, but they're as close to 100 as, as we can get them, which also helps for the technology we can't anticipate. In 30 years watching my segment of the industry decline, after, after um, you know, as a kid in 69, not only did we land on the moon, but the 747 got a TC, the Concorde got the TC, its TC. I mean, who would have thought that you'd spend a career watching aviation decline? But the upside to that is, Greg said, I'm going to make you cry, but then I'm going to make you laugh. Well, the upside of that is, the 2020s look really exciting. I mean, they are, uh, the technologies that uh, we've been almost inundated with requests for, for all kinds of meetings and projects and the stuff that's on the horizon for the 2020s is just exciting. Um, <coughs> we may see the 50s again, you know, in the 2020s. So it's very exciting. And, and hopefully this will facilitate a lot of what's happening. It's kind of a confluence of timing on a lot of different things. So this is the new rule. Just an example for stability, very top level. This is what's in 23 today. If we run it against some of these power lift machines that have been proposed, we've already had teams working on specific requirements for over a year. I took a look at those against the rule, and frankly, I feel like they fit no problem. And like Pat said, you're looking at 85%, 90% today where we can take even some of the 27 rules, they fit under 23 for these specific products. So I think we're almost there with the goal. talk about now is uh, the means of compliance aspects of this new rule. So uh, Lowell did a great job of framing what this new rule is and, and uh, a key part of that as he mentioned is means of compliance so we're going to dive a little deeper into that. Um, what, I, what I want for you is to come away from this with three, uh, three takeaways. Number one, uh, a good understanding of what performance-based rulemaking is and more importantly how uh, consensus standards and other means of compliance can complement performance-based rules. And then getting 
you know, a little, little more, you know, closer to home in terms of Part 23 certification. <clears throat> Number two, I want you to have a good understanding of what the new rule requires when it comes to means of compliance. And then finally, how to meet those new requirements of the rule. So in order to do that, we've, uh, we're going to cover a number of topics. So we'll talk performance-based rules. We'll talk about, uh, we've already talked quite a bit today about some of the advantages that those bring, but we'll talk about some of the challenges as well, briefly. And then we'll talk about uh, means of compliance and how they uh, can complement performance-based rules. Then we'll talk specifically about standards, uh, consensus standards in particular, and how those can be used as a means of compliance. We'll talk about ASTM International a fair amount because, you, as you know from this morning, that's the uh, standards development organization that has developed standards in support of Part 23. Uh, we'll also talk about the FAA's role in uh, both in the participation in the development of those standards as well as what we're doing to review and accept those standards. I know there's been some questions on that uh, already, and we'll get in a little bit more into that. Hopefully, uh, your questions will be answered. <clears throat> and then uh, we'll talk kind of more into the nuts and bolts of, of how to use means of compliance in a certification project. So we'll, we'll talk about some of the things that uh, you might have on your mind around, well, how, how's this actually going to work in terms of, you know, a particular certification project. So we'll touch on that. We'll talk a little bit about delegation, the impact of this new rule on delegation, if you're a DER or a, a ODA unit member. And then finally, we'll wrap up with some, a uh, little bit of idea on what's going on internationally. We, uh, Greg and Lowell have already uh, touched on that, and we'll just add a little bit more to that here so and again same same as you know this morning uh, don't hesitate to jump in this is uh, it, it always works better to have a dialogue while we're on the topic of something instead of uh, waiting till the end you can ask a question at any time but uh, but <coughs> for sure as we're going along uh, let me know if you've got something to talk about so we're going to jump into performance-based rules now uh, if you, and this may, may be obvious but I think it's helpful to kind of ground ourselves on, on what a performance-based rule is so if you think about a prescriptive regulatory system on the left here, and this is kind of gen generic in nature, but if you think about it in terms of uh, our world with uh, Part 23, establishes specific technical requirements that must be met by, in our case, an applicant or an approval holder. And Lowell had some, you know, several examples this morning of prescriptive rules. Uh, the one that really stands out to me is the one on lighting. Uh, it's very, very prescriptive. Uh, but another example would be uh, what's shown here, um, emergency exits must be, now this language is right out of the uh, Amendment 62 to Part 23, emergency exits must be movable windows, panels, canopies, or external <coughs> doors that provide a clear and unobstructed opening large enough to admit a 19 by 26 inch ellipse. So it's, it's very prescriptive, you know what you have to do to meet that rule. It, by contrast, a performance-based regulatory system again, focuses on the outcome that you're trying to achieve. So instead of, in this case, being focused on, you know, specifically calling out the size of an ellipse that has to fit through an opening, this is, uh, leaves a little bit more latitude in how compliance is shown. So this is language out of Amendment 64, the new rule. The airplane must be designed to facilitate rapid and safe evacuation in conditions likely to occur following an emergency landing. So that's, that's really the safety-driven goal that we're concerned about. Um, and if we go on to the next slide, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of look at some of the advantages and disadvantages of, of a performance-based rule. So one of the main advantages is something that uh, we've talked about a lot already today, and that is greater agility in accommodating innovation and new technology. So that's, that's really at the heart of this uh, Part 23 rulemaking effort. Uh, that's the main goal, uh, the main advantage, I should say. But there are also some other advantages around, you know, when you start to develop a performance-based rule, it forces you, like, like Lowell talked about, the team, really was, the team was really challenged to take a look at the existing rules and understand what was the true safety driver behind that regulatory requirement. And when you, when you do that, you start thinking, when you start thinking about the safety objectives, it, it really kind of shifts our collective thought process, both as regulators and as industry, uh, towards what it is we're trying to achieve from a safety standpoint. It's, it's easy sometimes, I think, in a prescriptive-based rules rulemaking uh, or rule framework to get kind of lost uh, in the, the details sometimes or, you know, lose, lose sight of what it is we're really trying to achieve. And, uh, and I think that, that the new rule, particularly from the regulatory side, kind of frees up our staff to, to think more, uh, more openly about new technologies that are being presented and what are the, what are the real requirements that need to be applied. We don't have to get hung up on the prescriptive details that are in the current rule if they don't 
really apply that well to new technology. We can take a step back and look at what is the safety objective we're trying to achieve, what's being proposed as a means of, of complying with that, and go from there. So those are the those are some of the strengths on the on the challenges side of uh, defining what what those requirements uh, look like in terms of performance can be challenging. Um, and I won't spend a lot of time on this because we have that rule now. So. Uh, Lowell and his team <coughs> addressed that challenge by creating this Amendment 64 rule, so we can kind of check the box on that one. What I want to talk a little bit more about is is uh, a topic that uh, came up this morning already, defining what compliance was. So uh, the, the one that, that you had asked about this morning, I think it was you that brought up on the, on the lighting. Uh, so we've got all this these prescriptive requirements in Amendment 62 for lighting. What happens to those? Where do they go? And and so, again, the same story applies. We're not losing that. It's been carried over. but. But I think the challenge, and what you were touching on this morning, the challenge again is in defining what what compliance looks like. If somebody's doing something different, if somebody brings in a, a new way of uh, of achieving the anti-collision function that's in the new rule, that's not LED or not you know historical incandescent. Okay, we we knew, we admittedly have a challenge on our hands because there's a lot of. Uh, the, the, the safety intent is captured in the rule, but it leaves the door open for all kinds of ways of meeting it. So the challenge is on the industry as a whole and on particularly us as regulators to evaluate what's being proposed and to make a determination <coughs> is, a, is that an acceptable means of showing compliance with the intent of the rule. So, so what you were bringing up is exactly one of the, probably the key challenge in all this is when you go to performance-based rulemaking, you, you get the advantage of having that flexibility, but you, it comes at a cost of, of having more gray area around what compliance looks like, and it puts a bigger task on the regulator to, to manage that. Uh, another challenge, and this is probably secondary, but um, compliance planning requires more effort. So even after we've uh, had standards or other means of compliance developed and accepted, and they're out there in the library or, or available to use, uh, Choosing which means of compliance to use and how to mix and match them and so forth can be can take more time on your part as an applicant on our part as a regulator in reviewing that. So, again, if you fast forward uh, a decade from now, in for any given section out of Part 23, you you probably will have multiple options for showing compliance, and so you will uh, again options are good, but they can also be uh, it can be time consuming to evaluate and so forth the analysis paralysis kind of stuff. So. Uh, you, you will have an opportunity to pick and choose and so forth, and then part of your responsibility is to make sure that uh, that those mesh together, that you don't have unintended interactions between you know, picking means of compliance one from one area and means of compliance three for a different section, and that's also on us in terms of our review of your certification plan and what you're, what you're proposing to do. So it just, it, again, I don't, I don't see that as a, as a big issue necessarily. I mean, it's certainly not an obstacle. It's just something to be aware of that it does create a new challenge that we uh, we, we have to some extent today, but not to the same extent we probably will in the future. Uh, I'm sorry, that was all. Uh, I should pause for a second. So we're, that's that's really all I wanted to talk about in terms of performance-based rulemaking and how consensus standards can serve as a means of compliance. Um, are there any other thoughts on that or questions before we move on to the next topic? Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll move on and talk about means of compliance and. Uh, you, you've seen this before. Um, it was covered this morning as well, so I won't read it, but I'll give you a chance to kind of reground yourself on that new section in Part 23 on accepted means of compliance. So what that what that new section is really saying, and it's a it's a really critical piece of this new rule. This this new rule doesn't really work <clears throat> without this 23.2010 because this is. This is kind of the, the gateway for what can be used as a means of compliance with the new rule. So that's what paragraph A, subparagraph A is saying, is that applicants must use a means of compliance that has been accepted by the administrator. Um, and this is a, the next bullet here is a, is a point of confusion, I think, for, for a lot of folks. Uh, the rule doesn't require that you use consensus standards in your compliance showing. It, it says that your means of compliance may include consensus standards. Uh, but your, your, as an applicant, your means of compliance package might include, you, know, you might use all consensus standards, you might use no consensus standards, you might use some combination in between. Uh, and we'll talk more uh, about some of the advantages of using consensus standards and why you might have a business reason for doing that. But from a regulatory standpoint, 
um, all 23.2010A is saying is that you've got to use a means of compliance that's been accepted by the administrator, and it can include consensus standards, but isn't required to. So paragraph B is where uh, you have the pathway for uh, proposing something else, you know, something that we haven't already accepted. And we'll talk more about that later as well, about how to go about doing that. And Lowell's already covered some of that. We'll go into a little bit more. I, I, I also, I, I should say, I meant to say up front that some of what I'm going to be talking about is going to maybe sound like a repeat for you. Uh, where there's a little bit of overlap. You can't completely separate the discussion about the rulemaking itself from this little bit deeper dive into means of compliance. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and cover these areas, even where there is a little bit of overlap, because number one, I think it's, it's beneficial to hear things more than once. But number two, we've, uh, th in this particular session, we've got, uh, we're, we're capturing it on, the, on video record so that uh, we can share it with other people who aren't, weren't able to be here. So um, hopefully it doesn't, hopefully if you see something that's already been covered this morning, uh, you're not bored. We'll try not to dwell on things that have been covered well already. Uh, but if we, if we look at, so if you think about, well, 23.2010, what does that really mean? Uh, how does that really affect how we do certification? It helps to look at this uh, graphically, I think, of if you think about what we have in place today, we have a framework that includes uh, regulations, Amendment 63 or 62 regulations that are prescriptive, as we've talked about. And then we also have this, uh, I can't get this pointer to show up on there for some reason. But yeah, it doesn't work on the screen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but we have this, this um, kind of bucket of means of compliance, and there's all kinds of things that go into means of compliance. Um, you're all familiar with these, but I think it kind of helps to recap them. So we have, you know, eight advisory circulars, we have a number of policy memos, we have a host of industry standards that are in use today through a variety of mechanisms, a lot of them through advisory circular references and so forth. Uh, and then in addition to that, we also, on a project by project basis, we have uh, issue papers, means of compliance issue papers. Um, so and those will, those will be an important part of the future too, but they're not new, we have them today. So, uh, so that, that's all what, that's what <coughs> the framework looks like today. And what we're talking about uh, happening in August, when this rule becomes effective, is we'll still have uh, a regulation, and uh, that hopefully is obvious, uh, especially after this morning, but early on in this, there was some confusion around that too. There was a misperception about what this whole effort was about and where we were going. Um, and it's, it's a key piece that we still have a regulation. Part 23 is the certification, are the certification requirements, I should say. Uh, it's just that now it's performance-based. And then we have this new, kind of new layer of means of compliance, which is means of compliance specifically accepted under 23.2010. So that's, this is the block that we've talked about already a little bit. We'll talk about more this afternoon around what uh, ASTM has developed. There may be other, other uh, bodies or individuals that develop things that would fit into that category as well. And then uh, the remaining material uh, doesn't go away, like, like Lowell mentioned. Uh, the existing advisory circulars are still usable using the cross-reference table that's in the final rule preamble. Uh, the, the industry standards that, have, that are part of the way we do things today and, and have historically done things, those are all still valid either through reference in the advisory circulars, as they are today, or like we talked about this morning, there are a number of uh, ASTM F44 standards that refer to existing industry standards as well. And then, of course, the issue paper path for if you're wanting to propose a means of compliance that hasn't already been accepted. So what's in red there is really all we're changing. It's a, it's a significant change. I don't want to minimize it, but it, I think it kind of helps to keep, keep in mind what's changing and what's not changing. And it's, it's really the keys are we're moving the performance-based rule, and then that drives this need for means of compliance accepted under 23.2010. Anything else? For uh, record keeping, I think you need today's uh, Amendment 62. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up too. And this is, you, you could think of this as 62 or 63. Um, so 60, Amendment 62 is what the ASTM committee uh, used for reference in pulling today's details over. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later too. But then what happened was, what was it two or three days before your rule, the 64 yeah. rule was finalized? We had an amendment 63 that hit the books. That was three a, days. It was a cross-product cross rule change that was for enhanced vision systems. So by cross-product, I mean <clears throat> it was a rule change that went into uh, 23, 25, 27, 29. Uh, 
So it just changed one section in the rule, and it added, it added uh, some requirements around enhanced vision systems. Uh, but even in that rulemaking, so that rulemaking was done out of uh, FA headquarters, and they were aware of the Part 23 effort that we had going on. And uh, in the preamble to the, I think it was the NPRM for that rule change, it talked about, you know, it, it acknowledged this move towards performance-based rulemaking on Part 23, and it said, uh, you know, when that happens, the, the provisions of this rule change around enhanced vision systems could serve as a means of compliance to the new Part 23 rule. So, so uh, kind of a long story, I guess, but there, there was Amendment 63 that was a very minimal change that was snuck in just a few days before the 64 to the streets. So. It's the shortest rule ever. Yeah, yes. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we'll talk about standards as means of compliance. Um, so as, as most of you know and, and probably practice uh, very frequently, we, we have, we in aviation use industry standards all over the place. Um, and if you stop and just think about the number of TSOs and, and other, uh, other certification related activities that rely on industry standards, it's, it's phenomenal. So what we're doing with Part 23 is not radically new. Um, it's not like we haven't used industry standards before, obviously. Um, it's just that we're using them uh, it, it, to a level that we haven't previously within Part 23. So we're kind of ex expanding on the use of industry standards. Um, and, you, you know, you, there, there's, I guess the, the, the other thing I wanted to mention about uh, on this topic is there's a variety of ways that those industry standards get recognized or accepted by the FAA. Uh, so TSOs, obviously, we talked about ACs, we've already talked about. There's actually an opportunity to incorporate a standard by reference in a rule. And when that is done, which isn't very frequently within the FAA, but that actually gives an industry standard uh, a, a regulatory force. I mean, it becomes a rule, essentially. Other government agencies, a number of other government agencies, use that approach uh, quite often. We're, we're following a different path, though. The model for Part 23 is, is through this Federal Register Notice path that uh, we've talked about a little bit today. And those are real citations there, if you care to look, look, look those up or anything. But we've, we've already accepted a number of consensus standards using that approach, uh, both for light sport aircraft, uh, which Greg talked about. And then we actually have uh, four standards accepted through that path uh, for use with Part 23 certification under previous amendments that aren't, aren't tied to Amendment 64. So that's the path that we'll, we'll use. And we'll have, we'll have a little bit more information on what that might look like and, and uh, how we're going to keep track of that later. One thing that um, we have talked about internally a fair amount, and I think it helps to talk about it in this setting as well, is uh, what consensus standards really are. Uh, so to the U.S. government, and obviously this, what I'm about to talk about may not, well, doesn't really apply globally. Each country has got their own approach to standards, obviously, to some degree. Um, but for the, for the U.S., consensus standard has a very specific meaning. So industry standard is kind of a generic term, and consensus standard is specifically uh, referring to a standard that's been developed with, with some particular attributes in place by the standards development body. And those are shown here, openness, balance, due process, and an appeals process. And uh, I, I won't go into a lot of detail on these. These are, these are discussed in an Office of Management and Budget uh, circular, A119, that uh, is available online if you care to look in, in more details. The, the, the two that I want to talk about a little bit here is uh, number one, openness. So that's talking about openness in terms of participation, as well as openness in the sense of transparency of the uh, standards content development. So that's important from the standpoint of who's, who's got access to the standards developing activity. If, if an organization is um, developing something with very tight controls on who can participate, it, it wouldn't be up to me to decide. There's probably some legal folks that would make this determination, but it, it may or may not be a consensus standard. Uh, that openness attribute might be in question, and the so folks would have to look at it and so forth. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. But the other thing I wanted to bring up is balance. So a standards development organization, if they're going to be developing something that's a consensus standard, they have to have balance in their membership or in, their, in the interests of parties at the table. So you can't have... Uh, I couldn't decide to uh, start up uh, Steve's Standards Development Organization, Inc., and bring only uh, manufacturers of certain types of products to the table and create a standard 
and call it a consensus, well, I could call it a consensus standard, but the government wouldn't recognize it as a consensus standard. Uh, it doesn't mean that it wouldn't be a good standard. I might bring some of the best brains in the industry together and develop a standard that's very, very good, uh, but it would not have had the balance of interest at the table from users of, that, of those products or uh, regulators of those products and so forth. So to the, for the U.S. government uh, to be a consensus standard, you've got to have that balance and representation. Um, the, the reason I, I bring this up is not because, so the, the new rule doesn't require that an applicant use consensus standards. Uh, and there, so the reason that these are, that these attributes are important just kind of have in the back of your mind is to understand maybe the process that the FAA would go through as means of compliance are proposed. If, if a means of compliance, if a standard is presented as a proposed means of compliance, something that we haven't already accepted, and it's a consensus standard that was developed with this pedigree, so to speak, it, it, all these attributes were in place, that, that, that gives us a certain level of confidence when that standard comes in the door. We're still going to review it and assess it for uh, whether it serves as an adequate means of compliance with the rule or not, but it comes in with a, with a, with a pedigree that something developed by Steve's standard developing organization doesn't have. And so that can affect the, the timing, uh, you know, how long it takes for us to review it, uh, understand what went into it, and whether it covers uh, this, the uh, safety objectives. Really, uh, so on a project-specific project basis, if it's within a kind of a narrow scope, we would envision the ACO making that determination without requiring any policy staff uh, <coughs> coordination. And, and within a limited scope, I mean, if it's consistent with, and again, there's some, you know, there's some judgment call on consistent with, but if it's consistent with a, a means of compliance that's already been accepted, uh, either specific on a project by project basis with that applicant or something that's globally accepted or whatnot, the ACO would have the uh, ability to make a call on that. If it's outside that scope and there's some details, um, some criteria listed in the AC, I think that we have on the subsequent slide here as well. Uh, but if it gets outside that kind of narrow scope, then it would invoke uh, most likely the issue paper process, which would go to the directorate in today's organizational structure. But where would the policy folks reside in the FAA for, uh, for Part 23 products? Uh, does, that, does that answer your question? Okay. Think? okay. So through this process, this consensus standard process, you wind up with um, with consensus, and, and the reason this is on here is because the, the U.S. government in this OMB circular uh, specifies and clarifies that consensus means general agreement. So the, the, uh, the government is not expecting that uh, you would reach, or a standards body would reach unanimity, uh, but that's important because a standards development organization to develop a consensus standard has to have some process for reaching consensus, recognizing that, that, that you're never, well, probably almost never anyway, going to have every participant completely on the same page. So it's, the process has to be able to handle uh, disagreements, uh, negative votes, uh, that kind of thing. And then uh, the end result, obviously, is a published standard. So hold on to your hats. This is where it gets really interesting. <laughs> We're going to talk about public laws and so forth. I promise I won't dwell on this too long, but I, I do think it is uh, important as a foundation uh, for, for how we got to where we are with Part 23. And we, we talk about this to even more detail in the ACO uh, workshops that we do, because one of the things that we've experienced within the FA in terms of uh, change management and, and trying to implement this new Part 23 successfully is a little bit of resistance around uh, such extensive use of consensus standards potentially. And even to the extent of we can't do that, we, that's abdicating our authority, we can't do that. And there's a number of things in place to make that not true, Num number one of which is we still have the rule, the rule sets the requirements. What we're talking about with consensus standards in our case are, are means of complying with those requirements. But more fundamentally, um, there's a public law in place that's been around for about two decades now, the National Technology Transfer and Advancement Act of 1995. And it not only allows federal agencies to use consensus standards, but it actually mandates that we use consensus standards to carry out our policy objectives. And you know, there are a couple of caveats to that, uh, you know, exceptions, I should say. But in general, we're, we're supposed to accomplish our policy objectives. Um, we're also supposed to be participating on consensus standards bodies. And again, this is, this is specifically around consensus standards. It's, uh, there's, a, there's a whole host of other means of compliance development activities that could be going on uh, in this OMB circular and, and the public law actually are silent with regard to that. It's specifically talking uh, consensus standards 
so standards that were developed using those attributes that we talked about on the previous slide. Uh, the other thing is the Small Airplane Revitalization Act that Lowell mentioned this morning. And it specifically, so the main thing it did was mandate that the FAA uh, implement the, a performance-based rule for Part 23. But in addition, under, it listed a number of objectives in doing that. And one of the objectives was to use consensus standards accepted by the FAA to meet those performance-based rules. So again, the rule doesn't require the use of consensus standards, but that was certainly uh, one of the goals of Congress in, in, uh, in passing uh, this, the SARA Act. And uh, one of the things that, uh, I don't know if Pete's still gonna be able to join us or not, but I know he, he's mentioned in the past and we've talked about it internally as well. This, is, this uh, law was passed uh, unanimously within uh, both, both houses or both sides of Congress. So uh, at a time when it's hard to reach agreement on very much. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, so we, we talked a little bit about uh, consensus standards in general. I'm gonna move on to ASTM International specifically. So that uh, ASTM is a, just one type of standards development organization that meets those government criteria for consensus standards that we talked about. Uh, one of the key things to, to keep in mind and Greg mentioned this this morning, but I just want to reiterate that it was the industry groups that were associated with the Part 23 Aviation Rulemaking Committee, the ARC, that chose ASTM as the vehicle to, to gather their efforts around and focus their resources on for development of consensus standards. The FAA is participating in that activity because that's where industry chose to organize their resources and, and efforts primarily. Um, it's, ASTM is not, some, not an organization that was selected by the FAA uh, for this activity. Um, the other thing to, to understand is uh, if, and, and you know, these slides, we've developed these slides for a number of different audiences, and so uh, many of you are probably aware of this already, but it, what, ASTM does not have technical staff who understand aviation or certification writing these standards. And this is something that we ran into internally within the FAA is there's a little bit of question around, well, what, what do, who is ASTM and what do they know about aircraft certification? Why are they writing standards uh, for use in Part 23 certification? And, and the answer is they're not. They're, they're an organization that uh, provides a framework for standards development, for uh, consensus development. Uh, they bring the right people to the table, but the people that are developing the technical content for these standards are, a lot of them are in this room. Uh, they're people who practice aircraft certification, understand it. Uh, it's a number of uh, aircraft manufacturers, avionics companies, uh, regulators, we have, uh, well, I'll get into more of the membership in a minute, but uh, it's, it's the volunteer members from across the industry and government and academia and so forth that develop this, the technical content. Uh, another thing just to, that bears uh, pointing out is that ASTM, again, they're not establishing, and, and no standards development organization is establishing a Part 23 certification requirement. I can't really stress that enough. The requirement remains the Part 23 rule. So the standards developed by ASTM may be accepted as one means of showing compliance with those requirements. Uh, there, there, are, there are other means, and then at 62 or 63, uh, and there probably will be other means as we go forward as well. Uh, so in other words, if, if uh, ASTM puts out a standard that uh, calls for a certain way of doing things, that that approach could be accepted by the FAA as an acceptable means, but it doesn't establish a, a minimum standard necessarily. Uh, other, uh, other standards or other means could also be acceptable and that may accomplish something a little bit different. We've had a lot of good discussions internally around this, and part of, the, part of it is in the context of our implementation of this rule as we go around to the ACOs and try to ground everybody. And, and I'll acknowledge that that is a real key issue. There's the there's the theory and the way it should work, and then there's the reality, and, and the reality is what we have to actively manage through communication and coordination with the ACOs on, on these projects. So the way, the way we look at it from the policy standpoint is the, the level of safety required in Part 23 is established in the rule, and even in Amendment 64, uh, other than in the areas of icing and loss of control, it talks about Amendment 62 as being the safety level that is carried over into Amendment 64. So let's say that, uh, and, and I'm going to describe this in very simplistic terms, and I realize the reality is more complicated than this, but let's say that Amendment 62 or 64 establishes a minimum safety, safety level that's here, and a standards development organization develops a standard, 
presents it to the FAA and, and we look at it and it certainly meets certainly meets the minimum requirements of the rule, but maybe maybe it goes even above and beyond what it needed to, it would still be acceptable. Well, so there's some room there. You probably don't even know where it is. That's why I say that it's a little bit overly simplistic. So we're talking, we're, we're taking a very complex uh, topic and trying to boil it down to, to simple terms, but obviously the, you get into the details of any one of these areas and it can be quite complex. But, <coughs> but the, so the, the standard, if, if we've accepted a standard as a means of compliance, it doesn't mean that there couldn't be room for another proposal that, you know, again, you can't, you can't quantify these to, it's not black and white, but somebody could come in with a different way of doing things that what, what our gauge, and this is, this is something that as we were developing, uh, was that in the FAQs or in the AC, I think it was in the FAQs, we had somebody who drafted some, some guidance that went down the path that you're describing where it said, okay, if once we've accepted a standard, anything else that comes in, we've got to weigh it against that standard we've accepted. And we said, no, no, no. And that got changed. And, and what, what it says now is, no, everything gets, everything gets re referenced back to the rule. So we've, we've got to look at a proposed means of compliance in relation to whether it satisfies the safety objectives of the rule, whether it provides a, a means of compliance to the rule, regardless of what, what else we may have accepted. We've accepted a consensus standard as means of compliance. I, I, I stand by what I said, that it doesn't become the minimum standard, but I do, I do acknowledge that, for, partly for the reasons we talked about on that slide with the, the bubbles around the attributes of a consensus standard, that, that sets a, a standard that's based on consensus input from the you know, quote, right people at the table and all that sort of thing. It was developed with those attributes that we talked about and so forth. So when somebody comes in with a standard that is different, and maybe not at that same level, uh, it doesn't mean necessarily that it's not also an acceptable means of compliance, but again, it gets back to what we were talking about earlier. The FAA's got a, a task on our hands to really evaluate that, so um, in the future, what might be perceived as, well, the FAA's not accepting, not accepting this because it doesn't measure up to what has already been accepted, uh, it could be a timing thing, it could be a review process thing, because we, we do have, you know, part of the power of a consensus standard development process is, is getting the right people at the table and, and achieving consensus. And when that international body of people who, who work these issues determine that this is the appropriate standard, then we've got our homework to do if we're looking and considering something that, you know, falls short of that or fits in between the rule and that or something like that. So I, I say that because I think, you know, the reality is the, the theory is one thing, and then the reality is another thing, and some of these things can take some time and some effort to work through. All right, the last thing there was just that, um, uh, well, you already covered this this morning. It, part 23 aircraft get a TC and a PC. ASTM happens to develop standards for both arenas, but other than that, the regulatory framework is completely different between the two, so we've run into some confusion on that with some folks. <clears throat> uh, so let's move on and talk about the committee itself, the F-44 committee under ASTM. It's a fairly large committee. There are about 250 members on it. Um, they're doing their work across nine different subcommittees. It, it does include representation from around the world. Uh, there's, there's 22 countries represented right now, and that includes a number of uh, civil aviation authorities. We've got uh, ourselves in EASA, Transport Canada, uh, ANAC from Brazil, CAAC from China, uh, New Zealand, Australia. Um, I think that I think that covers it. And those are very active members. These are all those CAAs are attending meetings, uh, looking at draft standards on ballot and commenting, uh, voting, and so forth. Uh, we also have, uh, you know, obviously with 250 members, there are a host of companies involved there too, and there's just a few listed there, some other entities as well. So the committee, in starting with uh, the Amendment 62 language as the baseline, uh, that doesn't tell quite the whole story. They also looked at CS23 and CSBLA and created an initial standard that encapsulates all those. So in a lot of cases, the, those rules are harmonized, but in, in some areas, there are differences across them. So the committee looked at each of those differences and made a decision about whether to, whether to funnel them into one common standard in a given area or carve out differences to account for a BLA type aircraft, for example. Uh, but in any case, with all that content, they, they, the way they organize it, they set it up into 29 different standards. Uh, and all, all 29 of those are published now. Uh, and we, we in the FAA are in the process still of going through those, even though we were involved uh, in the development of them uh, to varying degrees, uh, we still have a process to, to undertake with a formal review of those and, and a formal acceptance. So that's in work right now. 
uh, let's see, you talked about that first bullet. Um, and uh, yeah, we really talked about this earlier as well. So the next, the next few slides, and they'll get these slides afterwards, right? So you'll have these. This, the next few slides are just a listing of those 29 standards. So you'll, you'll have the standard designation and title on each of those. Uh, so to, to try to organize those 29 standards and, and, and to draw a bridge or connect them between, uh, or, or to connect them to the rule, I should say, ASTM is developing a top-level specification that Greg mentioned this morning. So it's really just like a top drawing or an index of those 29 standards, and they're organized in a way, in fact, if I advance one. This, so this is not published yet, and it's certainly obviously not accepted by the authorities because it's not even published. But this gives you an idea of what the committee is, is trying to achieve. It's probably hard to see in the back. But organizationally, uh, at the main paragraph level within this document, uh, it corresponds with a given subpart out of the rule. And between the FAA and the ASA rules, the, the section titles are fairly well aligned, probably at 90, 95% aligned. So there are a few differences in section titles. There are a few sections that it also has that we don't and vice versa. So it's not a 100% alignment, but hopefully that will get closer to 100%. Uh, soon, but then within that within that paragraph level, the subparagraphs correspond to the various sections out of out of the rule. So you can go in and, and see, for example, and again, this is just a draft, but uh, takeoff performance, which is 23.2115 in the new rule, uh, ASTM F3179 is intended as a means of compliance with that section of the rule. So the in, the intent is to for the CAAs to point as much as we can to this top level specification as opposed to accepting these individual uh, standards on a one-off basis. And part of that is to, to standardize uh, and, and harmonize globally on the content that we're accepting as well as on the timing. So we, what we want to do is, is create a system where you as an applicant have more of a steady target uh, around the world for what means of compliance has been accepted. Uh, if we had, if we were, if every CAA that's involved in this were accepting all 29 of these standards individually, it would be kind of a nightmare trying to keep track of what's been accepted in what country, when, uh, what are the deviations, you know, what are the differences across countries, and so forth. So I'm going to jump back, um, and I guess the only other thing I want to cover on this slide is, uh, so we, we have the ability within the FAA to accept something that ASTM has published, but to do so with a deviation or an exception. And uh, somebody might have been you just mentioned this a while back, but uh, so we may we may agree with the standard, you know, 99% of the standard, and so we will accept it. But you know, paragraph 5.1 change x to y. We we're trying to minimize that because uh, number one, it creates more bookkeeping for all of us in a cert project, and number two, it's going to run the potential for uh, uh, creating disharmony globally. If, we, if we're making deviations and EOS is making deviations and so forth, now you've got, again, different sets of, of standards to meet and so forth as an applicant. So our main goal, and I know uh, EOS and many of the other CAs share this, is to focus our efforts in the committee activity itself. So, uh, you know, we try to get our position into the standard up front, build it in up front, and try to have a standard that we can have a clean acceptance on where we can accept the entire standard at the end of the day. Any uh, questions or comments on the top level spec or anything? Okay. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit more about what our the FAA's involvement in that standards development process looks like. <coughs> so this slide is a simplification of that process. It, it certainly doesn't include uh, all the all the uh, members on the committee, of course. What it's intended to show is what an applicant's role might look like in this whole thing on the left. Uh, ASTM or, or the Standards Development Organization in the middle, and then uh, the FA uh, participation on the right side. So if we start in the middle of the chart, uh, develop standards content up there at the top center, uh, there's a lot that goes into developing a standard, and, and uh, it's a very, very iterative process, and we won't get into those details here. But, if it, but in the course of that, uh, we within the FA at the technical level, so Lowell and his, his counterparts, myself, we're involved in that standards development activity. Uh, and as an applicant, you have the opportunity to do that as well. It's, it's optional, uh, obviously, but you have the ability to do that as well. And collectively, we eventually will achieve consensus, and when we do, uh, ASTM will publish a standard. Now, at that point, again, it's, 
the FAA has another step to go through to accept that standard as a means of compliance. And so at this level of participation, we're talking uh, technical work, working level type people, uh, people that understand propulsion engineering or systems engineering or what have you. At this level, it's those same people, but in addition, uh, the, the management chain and, and some others. So this is, a, this is a formal review. This is the FAA decision. So uh, I think Pat alluded this morning to the fact that we were not exercising our vote on this committee. And that, that's largely because uh, we, we don't want to give the committee the, the wrong impression. We don't want to vote affirmative on something here if all the technical staff are OK with something. We don't want to vote affirmative and give the impression to the committee that that's an acceptable standard when it has not been through the, uh, the formal FAA review process. So that's why we've been asked not to exercise our vote. But uh, provided we find it acceptable, then we would issue this notice in the Federal Register. And then again, we would update our list of accepted standards that will be online hopefully soon. Uh, and uh, once, once that's happened, then those standards become available for use. So as an applicant, you could reference those in your certification plan. You go into your ACO with your cert plan, uh, or even we'll talk more about this in a few slides. But even you know, even before you're at the cert plan standpoint, um, as soon as you start having familiarization briefings or conversations with your ACO, the earlier you can let them know what you're intending to use as means of compliance, the better. And uh, if you're using standards that have been accepted through this process, again, there shouldn't be much debate. The only the only room for debate would be. Is that standard truly applicable to what you're doing? If you're doing something, you know, new technology that's that's really stretching the envelope, that the standard may not be applicable. You might have a discussion then. Uh, but that's that's kind of the. I mean, that's that's the bulk of the process. Obviously, as we use the standards, both industry uh, and FAA, we're going to learn things that you know we didn't know about when we were developing the standard. That gets fed back to the committee, and this is where I think the framework of this new rule really has a lot of benefit because, um, as has been pointed out a few times, uh, we don't have mechanisms in place within the FAA that allow us to respond as quickly as, as a standards development organization does. So as we start to get experience with these standards and we find that uh, something needs to be changed, that feedback goes right to the committee and they can uh, start a work item and have something revised within six months even, potentially, if, if there's no controversy. Um, so once we've accepted a standard, if we, if we have no, if we have not rescinded it, if we have not rescinded our acceptance, then that standard revision would be fair game uh, as long as it's applicable, uh, you know, the scope is appropriate for whatever the project is. So let's say that uh, ASTM, let's say we accept a 2017 version of an ASTM standard tomorrow, and then uh, three years from now, ASTM puts out a, a dash 20 version of that same standard and we also accept it. If we have no reason, like the safety case, if we, if we don't have safety data or some other valid reason for rescinding our acceptance of the 2017 version, now both versions are acceptable. And an applicant has the ability to, to choose either one of those from a FA certification and adding, ASTM adding additional means of compliance. So because Amendment 62 establishes kind of a baseline level of safety, most of the changes moving forward are going to be in the interest of industry, they're going to offer additional avenues, adding on to what's already in there. So, okay, uh, so let's talk about w what this means from a certification project standpoint. So, again, uh, identifying what you're going to use as a means of compliance as early as possible is really advantageous. So, uh, primarily because it, so if you're if you're using something that hasn't already been accepted, obviously that introduces program risk or can. And so the sooner you can identify that, the better, because it allows, uh, gives the ACO the, the information. They can start coordinating with the policy folks currently in the directorate. Uh, and we can start working through, if, it, if it's something that requires an issue paper, for example, obviously that could be a pacing item. So the sooner the better for all of us in terms of knowing what it is you have in mind for uh, means of compliance. Um, ob obtaining that acceptance up front is not, is not mandatory. I mean, uh, so, you know, that... There's, there's no real gate. Uh, I guess the ultimate gate would be the approval issuance, but, uh, but again, the sooner you can do that, the better. Uh, it's going to help your program go more smoothly. Um, it, by the same token, I mean, if you're doing something that's brand new technology, we, we understand that getting that means of compliance identified or uh, resolved up front may not always be possible. So just to the extent that you can, identify it up front and uh, 
if there are areas that need to be a little bit more fluid or maybe you have to get further through the project before you really know uh, what a means of, means of compliance to, to propose looks like, that's understandable. Um, any, any thoughts on that? All right. Um, so in terms of in terms of what's accepted for Amendment 64, so right now it's it's only uh, Amendment 62 or 63 language, and that's mentioned in the final rule itself. Uh, so, so again, the ASTM standards have not been accepted yet. Um, so again, uh, additional means of compliance as those become acceptable, they'll be noticed in the Federal Register if they're if they're accepted for general application, um, and then we have that summary list we talked about. Um, and then this question sometimes comes up, how will I know what alternative methods of compliance have been accepted for use on a project specific basis? So again, but because we have a rule now that has less detail in it, it's less prescriptive, uh, there, what, what in the past maybe was publicly available through an ELOS or something like that uh, may not be. So in other words, if, if an applicant comes in and proposes something alternative to, to a means of compliance that's been accepted for general application, uh, they're going to work that out with the FAA through the issue paper process, most likely. So you may be wondering, well, how, how can I get a hold of that? I want to do the same thing. Well, uh, that, that information would typically not be releasable by the FAA. <coughs> that would be a proprietary means of compliance. And if that applicant allowed us to release it, we could. But <laughs> typically, that would not be releasable. It would be subject to our normal FOIA process. But again, it would typically, typically be considered proprietary data. So unless the applicant wanted to disclose it, uh, we, we would not. Uh, so that's something that uh, I don't know how big of an issue or not that will be. Um, I guess if you're the, if you're the entity that, that has that, has developed that and gotten an acceptance on something, uh, that might be good news to you. If you're wanting to know what somebody else is doing, maybe that's not so good news to you. But at the end of the day, that's, that's just that's an artifact of a performance-based rule that has less prescriptive details in it and more reliance on that. a lot of discussions internally about that and the decision was made that it will not uh, with the caveat being what Lowell covered this morning there may be there may be specific technologies that get captured uh, around those notes that he was describing uh, close to parachute systems and other types of things but aside from that no there uh, there's we will not have captured the, the entire gamut of means of compliance that were used on a given project yeah so uh, it's a good question it's something that there's there were a lot of opinions uh, internally and uh, some pretty interesting conversations around that. But at the end of the day, the cert so the certification basis is the rule. And uh, uh, the means of complying with that rule is something that is not part of the type. It's not, it's not captured in the type certificate data sheet. It's not part of the type certificate data sheet. So. But, but the certification authority will have records of it. So. Yeah, so, so the means of compliance that was used will be captured in a certification plan. That's a certification document that's subject to document retention policies and so forth. So yeah, absolutely. Um, it just won't be on public display. Right, right. Yeah, so that's a good point. If, in terms of like ACO to ACO coordination or that kind of thing, there, yeah, that information will, will be captured. Um, and we'll talk about delegation in a, in a while, but uh, that's also something that would get captured on for delegated findings of compliance. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that later, but that's another place where that would show up. Okay, uh, so how do you get a new means of compliance accepted? Um, I think we've covered this pretty well. It's, uh, well, I guess what we haven't done, uh, we've talked about the AC, but, but I guess what I would say is um, it, I would, there's a lot of advantages, and I realize there may be some situations where there might be some disadvantages to this path too. You'd have to make your own decision from a business standpoint. But the first option I would look to is, is work with the ASTM committee because, again, you've got, you've got, some really good people at the table that you can work with to kind of flesh out that idea and get it into a standard that will not only uh, help you, I mean your motivation is obviously probably from a particular project you have in mind, but if you if you develop a means of compliance in isolation, uh, number one, it's going to, you know, there, there, you might have a longer path in terms of the process of FA review and so forth, but more importantly you're going to wind up with a means of compliance that's accepted for FAA use only. And then if you start trying to go globally with your product, you're going to have that same, you're going to have to do that same path over again with the ASA and with Transport Canada and what have you. 
if you if you take that to the ASTM committee uh, or or another consensus standards body uh, or or industry standards body, but take it to a standards body and work with your peers, you can get something developed that will be uh, potentially accepted for general application by us and the other authorities, and so you've you know, streamlined your path for for validations as well. Um, if you don't want to do that, and I re recognize there may be reasons why you wouldn't want to do that, um, you you can uh, go this project specific route. And again, early on on new technologies, that that might be uh, the appropriate path. Uh, it's kind of hard to standardize on something that's brand new. Uh, but just again, identify that to your aircraft certification office as soon as you can, and uh, it will probably trigger the issue paper process and that will give the right people involved to work with you on getting a means of compliance established. Um, one thing to keep in mind that in order for a means of compliance that you're proposing to be acceptable, it's got to meet the safety intent of the regulations, probably goes without saying, and, and meet uh, or maintain the level of safety established in Part 23. So um, that's very clear in the, in the final rule and, and the preamble that supports it and so forth. So that's kind of a, a baseline to gauge your proposed means of compliance against. Okay, um, I want to talk a little bit more about 21-101 again, uh, particularly as it pertains to means of compliance. Uh, so you might wonder what effects does, th does this have on uh, accepted means of compliance, the 21-101 anyway, change product rule? And the answer is it doesn't have any direct effect because again, 21-101 applies to the certification requirements. So this, we, that's referring to amendment levels of the rules. It does not directly affect what means of compliance uh, would apply. Uh, of course, it, it would have an indirect effect from the standpoint of you know, whatever your certification basis is that falls out of that 21-101 process <laughs> is going to affect which means of compliance have been accepted. Uh, so you might run into some things there, but no direct effects. Um, so. One of the things uh, that Lowell talked about is there may be some there may be some opportunities or some cases where, as an applicant, 21101 wouldn't require you require you to step up to the latest amendment, but it might be to your benefit to do so to take advantage of some of the performance based flexibility that's in the new rule. That's obviously something you would have to decide on your own uh, whether that works for you or doesn't. Um, when it comes to alterations uh, or changes in type design. Um, and this gets back, I think, a little bit to the question about what's going to get captured in the TCDS. Uh, this is an area where part, part of the discussion that we had internally was about whether to capture that or not capture that or whatnot. At the end of the day, a modifier is held. They're, again, they're showing compliance to the certification requirements, the rules. They're not, they're not held to necessarily the same means of compliance that the OEM used. Um, so that's what the focus is on 21-101. So uh, I guess that's the that probably the key takeaway from here, actually. Any questions or disagreements or thoughts on that? Okay. Uh, so let's talk about delegation a little bit. This is an area where, so neither Lowell nor I uh, are involved in delegation policy or, or, or even working with designees directly. Uh, so these slides are, are information that we got from our delegation uh, Delegations, delegation procedures branch in headquarters. Um, so they've been uh, they've taken a look. They've been working with uh, the team on this and understanding the Part 23 rule change, and uh, thinking about how it would affect uh, designees, DERs, and ODA UMs. And so they've developed a, a couple of items here. Uh, there's really not much change, but there are a couple of things, and they're rolling this into their uh, DER and, and UM training seminars as well. But uh, just like you're used to. Uh, the certification plan is going to continue to identify the regulations that the designee is authorized to make a compliance finding to, so that's obviously not changing. What, what is going to change, though, is that they're, they're looking for, or we're looking for um, the 8110-3 for DERs and 8100-9 for ODAs um, to identify what the means of compliance was that was used in showing compliance to whatever rule uh, you as a designee are, are making a compliance finding to. So they're looking for that in Block 7. On the, okay. the other area of, of effect, I should say, is uh, so some designees, and you may be one of them, have uh, limitations on your authorization that are tied to specific section numbers out of Part 23. And obviously, as Lowell covered, the whole numbering system has changed. So if, if, you, if that applies to you, you need to talk with your advisor and uh, get that updated so that you have your authorizations properly reflect the new Part 23. 
because no, nothing's going to line up now. So that's a, that's an example. You probably can't see that in the back, but that, that's an example of a situation where uh, some authorities are tied to specific section numbers. Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a, I'm told, is an easy change, quote, easy change. Uh, so hopefully that is the case. Just reach out to your advisor that applies to you. And this is just pretty much a recap. So uh, we'll take that comment back, and, and I appreciate you reminding me we did take that back at the time. Uh, and I wasn't making, I wasn't connecting the dots, but that is really the same issue. So we'll reiterate that uh, feedback back to our folks in headquarters. Okay, so then I uh, just want to talk a little bit about some of the things that are going on globally. As Lowell mentioned, EOS has issued their rule. Um, there are some, some differences. One of the things that uh, it is, so the wording is different, but the intent is really the same is uh, EASA has a provision uh, equivalent to ours in terms of accepting the means of compliance. So just like the Part 23 rule that we've talked about today, uh, the EASA rule uh, requires that an applicant uh, comply using a means of compliance that's been issued by EASA or something accepted by them. Uh, there, we talked about it. There's a number of other authorities that, are, that have been participating in ASTM. There's several of those that are looking at adopting a, either the FA rule or the ASA rule or, or, or hopefully not anything in between. Hopefully we can re all reach common ground. Uh, but those, those efforts are in varying stages. I want to mention with this is that uh, even in cases where we have differences in rule language, uh, so we're, we're, we're hopefully going to minimize those differences with some future activity that Lowell was alluding to this morning. But even, even, if, even after that, if we wind up with uh, differences in rural language, uh, we still see some room for a mutual acceptance of consensus standards as means of compliance to, to those differing rules, and which will pay some dividends for you as an applicant. Uh, so again, even if the regulatory language doesn't quite match, uh, if we've both accepted or all accepted uh, the same means of compliance to those rules, then that should make your life easier than it has been in the past. Uh, so all those CAs that I mentioned earlier uh, that are active on ASTM F44, we uh, work together through one of the subcommittees, and uh, I think Greg's probably going to cover all the subcommittees in, in a minute, but one of them is F4492 Regulatory Liaison. So that's a, that's a vehicle for us to have conversations about standards, proposed standards, and work together to, to harmonize. And we're honestly just kind of in the infancy of that. Uh, we have a long way to go, I think, in terms of... Uh, be working together more to get more of a consolidated CAA feedback back to the committee, but we have had some good successes so far, and we're building on those. And uh, the, what I wanted to wrap up with is uh, something that Greg mentioned. We are we are taking uh, we are making an effort to implement this rule successfully. Obviously, like Lowell mentioned, we don't expect it to work perfectly, but we're we're doing some things to to hopefully manage this change in a way that will make it more successfully implemented than it could have been otherwise. So we're doing these workshops at every ACO. We, we only have one left to do. We're also developing some computer-based training for our ACO engineers, uh, those that are new on board that maybe weren't able to be at the workshops. Uh, so that's in work right now. We've got the AC issued uh, showing how, to, how you as an applicant can propose a means of compliance under this new process. Uh, we've got the DER and UM training updates that are being made by the by our headquarters partners. Uh, we're coordinating with, with other CAAs, so not only in the, the rulemaking activity and in the standards development, but also in the, the communications efforts. We've been sharing our messages with uh, primarily EASA and Transport Canada and, and vice versa. They've been sharing their messaging, and so we're trying to get very uh, harmonized uh, communications to our employees collectively as well as to industry. The, they've had some industry briefings already and I think more planned. And then uh, finally, um, industry workshops like this. So we, um, this is the third and I think final one of these unless we get add more or more to the plate. But anyway, so we're doing some things to try to help uh, ourselves and help you um, implement this new rule successfully. So uh, the only thing uh, I've got, we'll skip that. The only thing I, I do have in these slides that you'll be getting a copy of there are a number of uh, online resources uh, in, in the back just to be aware of. So there's links to uh, Federal Register and the AC and the ASTM Committee homepage, all, all kinds of stuff back there. So just be aware of that.